Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have what might be, deter might be described as a chock-a-block agenda today. Um, and we need to respect everybody's schedule and be out of here uh, at four o'clock so that everybody can get airplanes and do other things. So we will begin at the stroke, or actually a couple of minutes before the stroke. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And, um, and thank you, everybody, for the incredible amount of work that has gone on uh, since our last meeting and is evidenced by the documents that you all have, uh, have before you um, today. Um, we made uh, an effort uh, to get these to you in a more timely manner. Um, our goal had been uh, even more timely, but, um, but um, there were some continuing work in progress, shall we say, from some of the working groups that, uh, that affected that. Um, but we hope that you've had a chance to review all of the um, materials so that we can uh, have a full and fruitful uh, discussion um, today. But again, thank you to the working groups, particularly to the chairpersons of the uh, working groups uh, for all of their, all of your uh, hard efforts um, on this, as well as to the staff that is sitting up here on either side of me that I'll kind of call out as we discuss these. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, our next meeting is the 27th of September, same time, same station, um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. Um, I, I know from a lot of the recommendations that there's work that has already been scheduled between now and then for the various um, working groups, and that's, that's great. Um, second of all is, um, you'll recall from our last meeting, the clicker, and the importance of the control of the clicker, um, and, and how the clicker occasionally flew across the room. We have a specific request from the technical staff at the FCC today to treat the clicker with the respect which it deserves. <laughs> and so we will be passing carefully the clicker around uh, today. And as the person who was the first to throw it last time, um, I, I, I offer my deepest apologies. Um, Lastly, in the housekeeping uh, department this morning, I um, received and forwarded to the chairman um, a letter from Dick Lynch um, announcing that it has been his intention to retire from Verizon um, this year and that he um, therefore uh, is going to be retiring from this body uh, at the end of this meeting. I told him I thought it was significant that he came for the free lunch today uh, <laughs> before retiring. Um, but, yes, right. but, um, but we, um, uh, Dick, you've been on this committee for years. We appreciate all of the contributions that you have made um, as the chairman of the broadband working group in this particular iteration of the TAC. We're grateful to you for the leadership that you've offered and we wish you Godspeed and the best in your next set of endeavors. So, Dick, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> Sir, Dennis. After you shared all these, uh, these very positive and very appropriate comments about Dick, I think that we should, as a body, let it be known by, by vote that we would recommend to the chairman that he not accept the resignation <laughs> and that Dick be therefore required to continue to complete his responsibilities to this committee. Is that called purgatory? <laughs> uh, the, I have to sit beside him for three hours? <laughs> the, um, the, let, me, let me move on. The, um, the, the chairman will do what the chairman will do, Dennis, you know. Um, the, uh, but again, some, some um, 
trying to get into uh, the agenda here today, we have a huge collection of topics to discuss um, and thoughtful papers that were developed to, to support them. Um, you all have a complete set of the slides and um, we would urge you, no, we would beseech you, uh, chairman, who are going to be doing the present presentations, to do whatever you can to fly through the early slides in terms of our mission, who we want to thank, um, and, um, and the broad areas, and to move as quickly as possible into uh, the specific recommendations because the goal of this meeting, you know, it's interesting, last meeting was kind of the low-hanging fruit. We're getting to some serious stuff uh, in this meeting. There's been some serious work put into it. Um, and we ought to have a full discussion amongst the committee uh, about all of these. So uh, to those of you who are going to be presenting, if you can please rapidly go through the early slides in your, in your section assume everybody has read them and uh, and get right down to the meat of the recommendations so that we can um, so that we can involve the entire committee and I will use this to start then on um, on that process <coughs> um, as a committee our job is to make recommendations to the Commission and then to monitor the follow-through on those recommendations um, we had eight recommendations that uh, came out of the last meeting and um, we wanted to, to uh, as I say follow up what's the report card on what the Commission has done um, this is a report card this is a self graded test I might add here okay because we asked the Commission to tell us where they were uh, on these and as you can see that they have put check marks in four of the recommendations in terms of underway and have not put check marks in four of the other uh, activities um, none of them for none of them is the response we think this is a terrible idea but they all are a work in progress um, yet to be delivered on by the Commission um, again you have these in your deck is there any comment that anybody wants to make on the Commission's self-grading um, and or um, any other elaborations on this okay hearing none then I'm going to carefully pass this to Adam so we got to get it all the way around there um, uh, Adam uh, and, and uh, David uh, Tenant House have been co-chairing the um, critical legacy um, working group um, with the support of Doug Sicker and Lisa Gelb um, and so Adam has the clicker reached you yet click away okay are we on the first page I don't think anybody can disagree with what's on this slide right now, Adam. Uh, <laughs> perfect. Okay, super. So uh, I'm not going to go and read the uh, meeting agenda. I think you have it in front of you. Uh, let me just very quickly turn to the next view graph. And that is we took a look at the transition from the PSTN and uh, I'd say deliberated over uh, what the transition should be to. I think what we came up with is an all IP network and very important to attach to it is future technologies which we can't anticipate today. 
Uh, when we looked at that transition, uh, there were uh, six topics uh, that we addressed uh, or wanted to address. New metrics for broadband quality. Uh, so if you take a look at an all IP network, it's no longer the same set of metrics that maps from what we have in the PSTN. It's a new world. Uh, so we'll emphasize that. Uh, quantify the size of the transition. I think first from the view of uh, carrier stranded assets. Take a look at national competitiveness statistics and benchmarking. Uh, looking at stranded devices that may be in users' hands as opposed to the uh, uh, operators essentially. Look at regulatory impacts and finally the economics of the transition. Uh, Again, great group of people, not going to dwell on it, but uh, I got to tell you, they worked very hard, met in the least weekly, if not more, and really fairly broad contribution uh, from everybody that you see on the list here. Okay, if I look at product status, uh, when it comes to new metrics for broadband, there is a uh, companion draft paper uh, that's been completed, uh, and there's a set of summary recommendations. And there are some obvious next steps to take, uh, I think, depending on the uh, feedback from this body. Uh, the same thing with quantifying the size of the transition. Uh, there's a draft paper, the summary. And again, uh, I think the most important thing is to figure out how you actually build a timeline and the right events for a transition. Uh, national competitiveness in progress. No report as yet, no recommendations. We expect that for the next TAC meeting. Uh, if I look at the issue of stranded assets, again, uh, fairly mature on the work that's been done. We believe that that would benefit from a workshop and refinement. Uh, and then if I look at regulatory impacts, again, uh, there's a companion paper, uh, summary recommendations, which I'll get into. And I think there could be some contribution to rulemaking uh, from that work. On the economic impact uh, part of this, we're just starting on that and again expect to report at the next TAC. So let me get into specific uh, recommendations. And what you'll find uh, as a theme is all of these areas are really uh, uh, tied together in, in, uh, in quite a few ways. Uh, if I look at uh, uh, the first of these, it's quantifying uh, uh, the uh, PSTN legacy transition. Uh, what is the number of subscribers? What happens as that number falls? And the cost per remaining customer actually increases. Uh, you know, where do you cross the line where the cost becomes untenable? And are there benefits to a faster transition that can, uh, in fact, uh, uh, be driven by either policy investments uh, or other things that come out of the FCC. Uh, I think what we would like to point out is that this transition is naturally happening to begin with. So there are a few, uh, few view graphs uh, that actually show the numbers for that. Uh, and I would say again we concentrated really on residential customers, not on government, state and local or nor the enterprise space. Um, and then um, I would say the second uh, uh, natural thing that's happening is the transition uh, that's, that's going from what are things based on the wireline, in fact, to mobile devices. Okay? Again, choice of consumers in today's world. Um, and so uh, I'm going to skip through some of the findings and let me really sort of uh, jump to the recommendations which are on the next page. Okay? Um, and the first of those is that the FCC should take steps to prepare for the inevitable transition from the PSTN. The second recommendation is that there be a date set for that transition when the PSTN is no longer the system of record for the nation, essentially. Uh, uh, third recommendation is uh, to provide incentives for operators to provide broadband services. Okay, and I think with the proviso that they be able to actually deal with the voice component of those communications. Uh, the fourth one, a lot of discussion in this particular study and some of the subsequent papers, uh, is that the PSAPs, uh, uh, the law enforcement component, not, you know, e, E911, all of those things are very important. 
So again, some form of subsidy there. Uh, a realignment of the regulatory requirements so you can actually deploy emerging technologies. Uh, assist broadband and OTT providers uh, by working with the security and emergency folks uh, to push the adoption of uh, IP-based solutions. And then lastly, to bring the national broadband plan uh, in alignment with the sunsetting of the PSDN, essentially. Okay. Uh, the next view graph, in fact, sort of gives you the trend lines. Uh, uh, the one on the right is the fall in the number of uh, uh, wireline subscribers. Um, and I believe the one on uh, the left uh, gives you the adoption curve of alternate technologies, essentially. Okay. So uh, I think, uh, uh, if anything, we probably wanted to make the recommendations a little bit more provocative than what I've stated today, uh, but in the least in the spirit of setting the table for a discussion and ending up at uh, you know, some logical conclusion in between. Okay. Uh, the next, the so next let me ask uh, a question here, Adam, for a second. Sure. Would it make sense, do you think, to go back to the slide with the seven recommendations and see what the committee has uh, as input for that? Super. In, rather than mushing them all yeah. together? I have a feeling it will be a lot easier for people to remember. Okay? So the floor is uh, open. Um, seven rather specific recommendations from David and Adam's group. Paul. I could just tell you and we don't have to tell yeah, anybody right, else. Exactly. So we just kind of <laughs> um, just, uh, it's just a comment on recommendation four where you talk about uh, PSAP. I assume you mean to couple that with the NG911 program yes, in general. So, absolutely. So maybe just point that out in general yeah. would be my suggestion so we don't get the wires crossed. Yes. Can I get a clarification on that too along the same lines? Um, this is, is this a recommendation for the commission to fund PSAPs, or is this that the government needs to fund so PSAPs? If, if, okay. So let me put it this way. If I understand it correctly, uh, the funding for that currently comes from several departments right. in the U.S. government. I don't think we're asking that that be changed, but I also know that Jamie Barnett's office has a very active role in this. Okay and that they be one of the pushers at the table. Okay. Okay? So this is not, this is not a, a, a recommendation that the commission go to Congress and get exclusive authority and appropriated dollars for PSEPs. So let, let, me, let me put it this way. I think what we identified is that emergency services, PSEPs, things of that sort, are one of the items on the critical path of making the transition. And eventually, somebody has to pay the bill for that. I would say making that known, recommending that there be funds available, I think is something that the FCC uh, can do as part of its bully pulpit, essentially. Okay? okay? Barb, and then Isn't John. it the case that most of the funding for PSAPs comes from the states through state mandated surcharges on telephone bills? So that uh, really it's not a, a federal. Uh, issue so much as a state issue. Yeah. Okay. So if I were to take a look at it, uh, there's a component of funding which comes from DHS. There's a component that comes from DOT. Okay. All of them participate in this game essentially. Okay. And the states are the eventual implementers. Is the issue a definitional issue of PSAP? a public safety answering point versus public safety? Is that where you were going, Marvin? No, I, I was just thinking the fact that the, the PSAPs themselves right. are typically funded largely by the states That's and through right. programs that the states implement, uh, as I say, with surcharges on, on local bills. And so the, the largest stream of funding is essentially managed at the state level. And I guess what I'm asking Adam is, are you talking broadly public safety rather than specifically public safety I, answering points, which as Marvin says are... Okay. I would, I would actually say more broadly than just the answering points. Okay. Okay. 
there's a considerable amount of infrastructure that has to exist for all of this to work. Okay? And you know, while there is a component of funding, and I'll agree with Marvin, that comes from, uh, uh, from the states, there's a significant component that's also funded by DHS. Okay, and that t tends to be in grants to the states, essentially. Okay, John. Just a request for clarification. Uh, what is it that you are proposing should happen on a date certain, whether that's 2018 or some other date? What does it mean to transition from the PSTM? Okay, uh, I could try. I could try uh, to try to give you something crisp on this. It's a f fairly long discussion. Uh, I think it may actually be best answered when we go through some of the other pr presentations which actually address the specific issues that have to be addressed in making a transition. Okay. Uh, be because it's everything from having it as a system of record, uh, having a regulatory regime that collects money uh, based on PSTN subscriptions essentially, uh, uh, things written into code and regulations that hang off the PSTN, okay. uh, mostly voice services. You know, we aren't saying get rid of copper because that may have uses uh, otherwise, essentially. Okay. So a lot of fairly complex issues, and I think as we get into this, I think some of them will become evident, essentially. Could I, could I ask a clarification? But, but really, to turn off the PS literally means like turning the power off on the 5 ESS switches? Is that what it means? turn off the BSTM? Uh, let me put it this way. I suspect if somebody wants to continue to operate a switch after the transition, they're welcome to do it if they can make money. It's just that the regulatory regime under which that will be done will be very different, essentially. Thank you. Yeah, Mark. I'm curious. Uh, first of all, I found your graphs to be fascinating. I had not seen that before, and uh, that's amazing. I'm assuming this is a competitiveness issue uh, with the rest of the world. Have you, did your committee look at it, at the graphs of any other countries or how this is progressing for other countries that we're competing with? Okay, so as I reported in terms of the issues we're to address, uh, I believe the uh, national competitiveness was study number three. Okay. That's in progress and we expect to have a readout in fact, at the next TAC meeting for that, okay? We have gathered a lot of the material. I would say we haven't analyzed it as yet. Do you have a feeling for it? Yep. Are you doing good? David. Okay, yes. <laughs> I, uh, I apologize for not having had the chance to read the report, so I may be uh, speaking in ignorance here, and so I apologize, but it seems to me there's an issue lurking under here which eventually will need more clarity, which is to tease out the relationship between the broadband wireline space and the, the mobile wireless space. If you say that you want to move to an all IP network, which is what you say, I look at this graph and it says, you know, 33% of the population is on mobile. That seems to carry an implication for me that you imagine that the, that the mobile experience is going to be entirely IP by, by 2018. And, and I don't know whether that's really what you were implying but right now we have very different regulatory and business issues in the mobile space and in the broadband wireline space and it seems to me sort of acknowledging and bringing that out might be a useful component of this discussion so le let me address that the following way in fact uh, our group caucus this morning and uh, again for the next TAC meeting we felt we had underplayed the role of wireless so we're adding a study group that specifically looks at that issue and its role in, broad, in broadband, okay? In the broadband and IP world. And if I look around this table and look at the number of folks who have plans for LTE deployment, which is really IP enabled uh, to a great depth, uh, I think that's very much part of the future and really does have to be addressed. Mm -hmm. okay? And so far I would say we haven't put enough uh, enough into that aspect of the problem, okay? So I think you're you know, on, on the money with that. Adam, Adam, I just, Adam, I just also wanted to add that in our group this morning, we also discussed that we thought 
to, to John's question before, we thought we also owed coming back to the TAC with a more rigorous definition of what does it mean? What, what are we saying here when we say to um, sunset the PSTN? What does that mean? So we actually, we, we agree with your question and we, I think we need to do some work yeah. with it. And you can help us if you want. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Um, also, uh, this morning, we, uh, if you look at number seven, our recommendation, we do um, say that the PSTN sunset timetable and the national broadband plan and wireless rollout have to be synchronized. We know we need to do more work in that area, but what uh, part of our saying that there ought to be a date certain is to look at what the prerequisites are for that date certain. And so we're saying that you can't, whatever shutting down the PSTN means, and we'll be more rigorous about that next time around, uh, one of the things it means is that you've reached the prerequisite of making sure that everybody who has PSTN service today has an alternative. Um, and that's the place where we need to work on synchronizing with the national broadband plan, but also uh, with cellular rollout. And maybe the two mean the same thing by 2018, but we have to be more rigorous about that and plan to. Which is all a part of, uh, a huge part of the ongoing discussion about USF and everything that happens. Yeah, absolutely. So, so David, is it, trying to think about, about what the committee ends up recommending, is it, is it safe to say from this discussion that item one, the commission should take steps to prepare for the inev inevitable transition, is then defined as three, four, five, six, and seven. Mm -hmm. And that item two is, uh, as Nomi just said, come back with a more rigorous discussion. Correct. Yep. Of, is that the group, I mean, is the group comfortable with that kind of an outcome? Yep. Go to your magic clicker then. Okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So the next item is new new metrics for broadband quality, and um, I know Walter uh, has just conducted a been involved in a whole set of studies on uh, uh, broadband performance, uh, speed, jitter, latency, things of that sort. Uh, I think Bud Tribble, uh, who unfortunately couldn't be here, uh, was the main author of this piece. And what he recognizes is that uh, in today's world, okay, as opposed to the world of a few decades ago, people have many, many more means of communication at their disposal than they had in the past. So when you look at the whole regulatory regime and you look at quality of service, it means something very, very different today than it may have meant in the past. So if you look at most homes, most establishments, multiple cell phones, still a few of those wired phones, IP phones, messaging devices, lots of different ways of communicating in which voice is not the only method, essentially. Okay. And uh, okay, in, in light of all of this, Okay. What we find is that the set of applications for broadband networks requires quality and reliability metrics that go way beyond simple speed. You really have to know what people have on them, what they have access to, what's reliable and what's not. Okay. And you no longer rely on a single means of communication to be able to achieve uh, the value of an application, essentially. Okay. So we recognize that there's already much work in this area, and uh, I think we find that the metrics for robustness and reliability should really take into account the diversity that's going to be provided by next generation networks. Okay. So fairly specifically, when you start looking at this, uh, and these are the recommendations uh, from the group, uh, the first is that the technical metrics for replacement of the PSTN need to go beyond just the measurement of speed, uh, and I would say what goes along with that is jitter latency, uh, the normal technical uh, parameters. 
that we continue to focus awareness on the issues of quality of service and network reliability for, broad for broadband in addition to just speed, and that the participation of industry and consumer groups, as well as additional research and innovation to develop those new metrics, uh, should really be encouraged, and the importance of building the next generation network in support of public safety uh, should be made clear at the national, le national, state, and local level, and that that build-out goes beyond just simple voice services, essentially. Okay? Okay. Uh, I think, uh, parenthetically, the issue of location, its accuracy, things of that sort, also plays a significant role here. Okay. 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 Any comments on those four? <laughs> Nomi, are you? You're okay. I know you had some feelings. Okay. Who do we? Yes. I'm sorry, Robin. Uh, one of the things that, that needs uh, to be looked at if we're going to take a systems level view of reliability uh, that accounts for the fact that there are alternatives is that we also then have to understand the common mode failures of these separate systems uh, if we're going to get a right, a correct estimate of what the overall reliability is. And, and that needs to be emphasized. Yeah. Yep. I think y you may have it are actually captured your team, but it, just an observation back to the subject of wireless again. One of the challenges even with speed on wireless is it varies pretty dramatically as a, as a function of where you are and the circumstances around you. So I don't know if you call that quality of service or something, but in the all wireless world, that's a component that I think needs to be thought about. Well, I mean, I, I would say if you look at a world where uh, in the market, a large fraction of the population only has a wireless connection, uh, yes, you do. And, and we're heading to a world where wireless is going to be the wrong definition because yep. we're going to have mobile wireless and we're going to have fixed wireless and we're going to have Absolutely. LMR, which is a kind of wireless. You know. Uh, yes, Jeff. I have a question. Uh, and what percentage, as you make the transition to IP, what percentage of this traffic do you expect to go on the wireless network versus um, the wired IP network to the home or through a 802.11 router rather than the home into the wired or fiber <coughs> network? Okay. So I think Shahid, uh, would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, a couple of things uh, I want to make comment on. First, um, we are seeing a major trend among the younger segments around uh, uh, wireline displacement through the use of wireless phones. So the statistic here, uh, I think somebody just pointed out, it's about 30 percent of that population has just wireless phones used for voice purposes. So that, that's, that's point one. Um, the, uh, the second point around uh, the uh, the actual displacement of fixed line that's happening organically and uh, as a result of a lot of the over the top plays whether it's Skype Von Edge and other other um, services that provide voice as a service on top of IP so um, if you add all of those things together there's um, there's definitely a natural tendency of of this transition happening by itself um, I'm not sure if that was uh, exactly what you were asking. No, I was just trying to understand how much of the, the voice data load will fall on the wireless network versus how much of it will fall into a wider band with wired connection, uh, either wire or fiber, replacing twisted pair copper. Right. Well, well with LTE, um, everything um, will be IP and voice would be just an application over IP. <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, just taking LTE out of the equation, obviously with cell phones you can make voice calls today. Uh, just a function of coverage yeah. at this point. So actually, I, you know, I, I don't know that we have the specific statistics with us today, but if, if you were to look at various segments in the enterprise space, okay, a lot of stuff has already moved to be IP-like services, okay? not necessarily wireless. Uh, and even there you're starting to see a fairly large penetration of wireless devices, okay, 
Uh, so employees aren't give, being given a black phone on their desk, uh, they just have a cell phone, okay? Uh, I'm not sure I have the statistics with us, but we hope to, in fact, you know, uh, next, uh, next chapter on this uh, be much more specific on that kind of data, okay? I think we have actually gathered it, but it's not analyzed. Yeah, yeah no, so the, uh, in the enterprise side, um, almost 60% of all large enterprises, Fortune 500 businesses, have moved already to IP hosted services. So they're running all of their voice infrastructure over IP. Okay. Peter. Um, I think the group's done a great job because it's such a complex subject and I, I am making an editorial comment that having a forcing function of 2018 is great because you need some forcing function around Rich to rally people on these issues but to support Mark's point I believe that the collision of politics and technology will land right on that 2018 date and it's going to be a really tough and complex conversation so I'd like to support what Mark said. I believe there are some competitive metrics around what's happening outside the United States that could support this group's work because then if we reframe it as a competitiveness issue and less around technology colliding with politics and economics, maybe we can reframe the conversation and take some of the emotion out of it because otherwise I anticipate that as well-intentioned, and I personally don't think it's aggressive enough, but I'm not a member of the group, so I'll <laughs> take that comment away. But. But, uh, Adam, I think you and the group have done such a good job that I hope it doesn't get swamped by the politics and maybe the international perspective that Mark has brought to the conversation can help you. Tom? Yeah, and without uh, addressing the specific day, um, I think that we can take a lot of the heat out of the argument about what the specific date should be and the need for a specific date based on, I, I don't disagree with you, but an even more compelling domestic issue which is that if you follow that curve down to six million residential subscribers to the PSTN in 2018, you see that the cost, per, the social cost per subscriber of continuing subsidies to the PSTN uh, is arguably larger than any cost uh, of transition or of creating the preconditions for transition. Um, and so I think we can frame the arguments um, in terms of accomplishing the current objectives uh, of the USF um, in an environment where customers have voted on their own uh, to move away from the PSTN. And that choosing the date is in fact choosing the date where it's cheaper um, to completely finish the PSTN than to keep alive the stub of the PSTN, even recognizing uh, that there are, there are costs, well, some of them one-time costs, that'll have to be borne to get to that date when you can do the transition. So, uh, so we have a positive reason uh, for wanting to make the transition by a certain date, and it is in fact impossibly unaffordable uh, to delay the transition uh, in, because the cost of the subsidy is by line mile and the, co and the number of subscribers keeps going down. But, but I think Peter raises a really good point in terms of the, the, the real politic of the whole thing and particularly um, with the pending USF mm -hmm. issue. Um, and, and that is clearly going to be a threshold question that has to be resolved before any date can really be mm -hmm. established. Um, so, so one of the things that I was trying to do in, in my uh, summary um, w with Adam was, was to skip number two, was to say that number one then has three, four, five, six, and seven, but not number two informing it, and that the group is going to come back with a more rigorous definition that will Im again, deal yeah. with some of these yeah, issues. Yeah, fair again. Okay. Yep. Um, back on the, the broadband, yeah, I'm sorry, Dave, go ahead. I wanted to Every, and I like everybody has now good, good uh, <laughs> format to call I attention. To back to this question a little while ago about what percentage of the traffic is going to be on the wireless network and so forth, and I, I want to argue that this is not a space in which we should be looking for an answer. There's more than one possible answer, and it really depends on who invests in which outcome. If you, if you look at wireless devices that I might carry, one possibility is they continue to 
take advantage of the traditional cell tower architecture, or maybe we move toward a picocell architecture that takes advantage of broadband circuits into the home, or maybe we have dual band devices that use Wi-Fi in the home. Those very much, those change different loads on different parts of the system. And, and the reason I bring this up is that the driver for these choices is not just going to be the voice service. It's going to be some of the high data volume services that people also use on those systems, video and so forth. And so this hasn't looked at that at all, but those are going to be drivers of the architecture which then will determine how voice is done. And so I don't think you can completely ignore those other applications and focus entirely on voice if you want to know what the world's going to look like in 2018. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I'm mean, sorry. Yeah, so, so let, let me do the following thing. Um, I think we would wildly agree with you that the focus isn't just voice. There are lots of other functions. And as the IP-based solutions become richer and richer in those functions, you know, the PSTN will very naturally start decaying. Mm -hmm. The question is, how long do you carry it? Right. Okay? Right. I, and I, and I, what's I, driving it is this multifunctionality where voice is just an application. No difference between voice and angry birds. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Dale. Uh, I'm just going to comment that uh, I'm a little confused here because my vision, this wireless versus wireline, is, is that the wireless is going to be a pretty short distance to be able to get the frequency reuse we need to make the capacity requirements. So most of this traffic is going to go over a fixed net, fixed network. So this distinction we're making here between fixed and wireless doesn't make an awful lot make an awful lot of sense, awful lot of sense to me. The the. The issue being one of last mile versus backhaul. So we're, we're, yeah, we're back, at, for we're example, at the yeah. Last, I mean, this, that's this not going to more of a last mile discussion. And, and, right? and, and, and quote the definition of backhaul is probably getting deeper, deeper and deeper yeah. into the network. And therefore, it seems to me that we it, it, there's you got to be careful. It sounds like wireless is going to somehow displace wireline. And I would say no. Wireline is becoming more important. At least fix it becoming more important for its role in in, uh, in backhaul. So Dale. Let me maybe address it the following way, because again, no argument that you can't do wireless without backhaul, okay? and it is important. When you look at the PSTN, there are a number of aspects to it, okay? and the heart of it is it really was a system tuned to carrying voice. Therefore, there's a lot of infrastructure built specifically for that purpose. We are not talking about sunsetting copper. We're not talking about sunsetting fixed connections. We're talking about sunsetting the aspect of that infrastructure that dealt specifically with voice only. Yeah, you're up the protocol stack, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there are a lot of things in that space okay, that are very expensive that you have to carry as an operator. Okay? And you know, having come from the viewpoint of being a monopoly at one point is an incredible layer of regulations uh, that sits around that. And that's built into standards, it's all over the place. Okay. How do you flush that part out? Okay. So, so and, I, and I think we, we will come back with a much tighter definition. It's obvious that we haven't done our homework on that. Well, on the, on the issue of the, of the metrics, yeah. uh, again, trying to get this to, I mean, four great recommendations, trying to get this to a, uh, a report card kind of format. Is it, is it really what we're saying here is point one, the technical metrics need to go beyond the measurement of speed, and therefore the commission should bring back actions which two, three, and four. Yep. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to... That's a good way of framing it. So, so, so there, is a, there is an action component in our recommendation here yep. that we're saying to the commission. Yep. Is the body... Concur? Okay, Adam, you're on a roll. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, um, so the, the next study was non-carrier stranded assets, and those are the aspect of devices, which devices and systems which are in users' hands okay, that hang off the PSTN essentially. Okay, so they're everything from line power, battery backup, ring voltage, dial tone. There's a whole list here. Uh, dial back devices for, uh, for fire alarms, 
uh, fax machines, uh, X switches, lots of stuff that's out there. Okay? And what we find is that for almost every one of those, there's a technical solution that's IP based that could be applied. So it's not a technology issue. We find that the impact of uh, flushing this out, again, will probably be greatest in rural America. And that is because you need a replacement technology and cost money. And that there is a clear advantage to get people off of these systems if you set a date certain for when the PSTN can no longer be relied on to provide the underlying service, essentially. Okay? And so uh, uh, if I look at the uh, uh, recommendations, uh, and I have a feeling my draft copy okay, uh, is right here. So there were seven recommendations. Can you hit the clicker? Okay, yep, forgot to do that. Okay, so uh, the first one is to actually explore and set the date uh, for sunsetting the PSTN, uh, develop a timeline to ensure that there's a smooth transition which addresses the stranded assets, uh, assure that mobile or broadband replacements are in fact uh, available everywhere the, uh, the PSTN currently exists, so this is the need to align the uh, national broadband plan uh, with the PSTN transition. Uh, so that's the next item, in fact. Uh, and then what we would recommend is that the USF funding, uh, in fact, be sort of shifted over to support universal coverage and other social goals that make this replacement possible. Uh, I would say we recommend that we further investigate emergency services and make sure they have no components that, uh, in fact, hang off the ISPN. And uh, lastly, investigate incentive program uh, for mediation devices uh, to figure out how do you bridge the gap between what's already deployed and the new IP-based services. Okay. So I think open for a discussion. Comments on uh, any of these seven? Yeah, Harold. numbering plan and I'm assuming that there's been some discussion there uh, obviously whether you maintain the legacy international and national dialing plans and, or would they be usurped by the the IP computer to computer or voice to voice um, planning so just want to comment on that <laughs> sure. Uh, I think the U.S. is a member of the ITU. Okay, uh, the ITU supports sort of the universal numbering plans, things of that sort. And uh, the question is, you know, do you replace those or do you create a version of those that actually functions in the IP world? Uh, I would submit that there are lots of devices that vendors have today that, in fact, support things that are SIP-like and at the same time support things that are based on numbers. Yeah, table lookups are very easy to do in today's world. So I guess okay. the question is, is that the, re the recommendation to investigate that, or do you have a recommendation at this I, point? I would say there are lots of options, and I think it's probably best to investigate it and end up with a plan and align it, again, with the rules, regulations, treaties that the U.S. participates in. Sorry, I didn't see you hiding it. sure if this falls under this section or the next one regulatory mm -hmm. but you mentioned USF funding did you consider other will you consider other things like reciprocal compensation any sort of access funding uh, any sort of the uh, compensation regimes that, okay. that change so I think in the discussions we had we looked at everything from schemes very similar to the DTV transition okay uh, so the answer is I think that's all grist for the mill to take a look at those kind of options, essentially. This is just one, okay? Okay. Okay. Yeah, Greg, and then we'll. Yeah, uh, did your group look at, or is there any concern about the um, the availability of a an IP-based world? Uh, 
versus our, our, our conventional PSTN in a time of national emergency or civil unrest. I'm thinking of <clears throat> what has happened some other places with uh, the internet uh, being affected and, and uh, would that have some impact at least on a portion of an IT base? So the answer is yes, yeah. okay, and if you look at the table, uh, I think one manifestation of that is GETS, okay, it's the national system, priority system in times of crisis. Uh, I understand DHS is actually working on an IP version of that, okay. So this is all ongoing work and there are technical solutions that would allow you to do similar things, okay. And I'm sorry, Jeff. Okay, I'm going to go Richard and then and, come and down in here. In fact, let, let me make a point I think that Vint, uh, Vint Cerf made last time, okay, and comes from Bud Tribble's piece, and that is, you know, in the, in, in the way we approach emergency communications, uh, we now have a world where each individual has access to a lot more devices and a lot more paths to communicate than they had in the past, okay? And the comment I heard previously is this really has to be addressed at a system level view, okay, and make sure that there are no common mode failures and that you can in fact achieve these functions in an IP world, okay? And that's well worthwhile study. Okay, Richard and then John. Uh, Adam, would it make sense that the uh, target date for uh, replacing the PSTN would be the date when the cost to continue to maintain the PSTN exceeds the cost to replace it with a uh, broadband alternative? I, I would say that that's one, one way of approaching it. Okay. You know, it, it's a fairly complex issue because there is the capital cost into, that goes into maintaining it there's the operational cost, and then there's the sliding number of subscribers that makes the cost per subscriber go up, okay? Uh, and, uh, you know, you can look at it at an individual company level, you can look at it at a national level. I'd say this is part of what we're discussing on the economics at this point, okay? And again, as I mentioned, the economics aspect of this is something we intend to report out at the next, uh, for the next hack. John. One question um, about the, the, particularly to the time frame of the transition that you've outlined. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, given that the, the proposal outline, you know, goes out to about 2018, um, as, as you'll hear when, when we talk about the IP6 working group, you know, we, we certainly expect that there'll be some, you know, some constraints from an IP resource point of view. Um, what, what point of view or what, um, you know, what sort of considerations uh, ha have been uh, taken into account as far as uh, next generation uh, IP technologies like IP version 6? Well, I, okay, so I think very specifically, you know, when we looked at the transition, we said IP or newer technologies. Okay, and I can't read the crystal ball to know what else is going to pop up. You know, I can look at past experience and I look at the Communication Act of 1996. Uh, the internet was hardly mentioned in that. I think it was in two places. Okay, wasn't anticipated. Okay, so I think you know wh whatever the nation goes to has to be robust, has to last for some period of time, uh, so that the investments can in fact be made. Okay, I haven't said t two things at this point, okay, and that is when I look at that date of 2018, it's a, it's a marker. Okay, what we're really talking about is setting a date. That date has to make sense. I would say the deliberations haven't brought us to the point uh, where we can in fact set a date that makes sense. So this is a provocative one to get everybody to think about it, okay? I think you called that one provocative. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to get provoked? <laughs> provoked. So yeah, go Tom. Tom, sorry. go back, just elaborate a second on the cost question. Look at it. There's obviously the question of cost to whom. Um, carriers, we speculate, will find very quickly um, that the cost of maintaining the PSTN is simply unsupportable 
um, as the revenue base goes down and that the reaction will then, uh, and I, I'm sensitive to this coming from Vermont where Fairpoint just went bankrupt, uh, just emerged from bankruptcy I should say, um, but so that there'll be a, at least an attempt to cost shift to government and to say that, look, we the carriers simply can't do this anymore uh, and that, the ca and that in, unless government is prepared with a plan that has an exit strategy, we're in a sense hostage to the costs which nominally belong to the carriers, but on the other hand, if those costs aren't met from somewhere, there's a significant, even though small proportion of Americans who are left without access to 911, uh, you know, even much worse than the analog to digital TV comparison. So a uh, long-winded way of saying we have to look not only at the private cost, but particularly at the public cost that's likely to be incurred uh, given different scenarios for an end date. So let's, let's kind of pick up on that and, and, and again use the same kind of format we were using previously. So, so recommendation one is, and, and this is the first time at least I've heard at a body like this, this fulsome a discussion about, hey folks, it's coming to an end and we need to start preparing for it. Um, so, so the recommendation, Adam, I'm looking at you, is the recommendation, one, to explore the end dates, that folks, we need to now have an activity in the FCC that starts to explore the end dates, yep. and in that process considers yep. the following six issues. Yep. Is that where the Good way of stating. committee is? Okay. Okay. On to your last one. You only have one to go. <laughs> okay, let's see. Are we up? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so I think the, the last one was looking at regul regulatory impacts uh, required for the transition. And uh, I think our problem statement was to identify the necessary changes to address the change in technology from the PSTN and to maintain or establish, and I'm going to put an emphasis on this, the least restrictive regulatory environment that still protects the public interest. Okay. So instead of uh, going regulation heavy, uh, I think uh, consensus of the group is can you end up with a regime that's regulation light? In doing that, uh, uh, we have three findings. The first is that some regulations that protect basic rights uh, of citizens, such as universal communication access for the disabled, the poor, those in rural areas, re reliable access to emergency services, and consumer protection, uh, that there is good reason for keeping those in place, essentially. Uh, if you look at some regulations that are really PSTN specific, when that is no longer the system of record, uh, those should not be retained uh, post the transition date essentially. Okay, and then there are new standards that need to be created uh, that again uh, uh, sort of uh, in some common sense uh, look after the new functionality that's available in the IP networks. So specifically, uh, if I look at the recommendations, okay, uh, the first one is that universal access to reliable emergency communications should continue to be guaranteed by regulation. Okay. The second is that access to communications for persons with disabilities should be guaranteed by modifications of the current regulations to acknowledge ubiquity of personal computers and other devices of that sort. Uh, consumer protection against misuse of the communication system should continue to be regulated with modifications to acknowledge the different landscape of communications. Uh, again, we had the uh, uh, issue of PSAPs uh, uh, and uh, you know, how essential they are essentially. 
Uh, the regulations that support the monopoly aspect of the PSTN should be abandoned and sort of a recognition that there are really two tiers of communication services, those that meet the regulations and those that do not, and those should be clearly explained to the consumer who can then make an informed selection uh, and regulations must make available highly reliable communications for critical industries. Okay. So I think that's the um, uh, discussion of, of any of these. Yep. I don't believe, oh, what a quiet yes, Dale. group. Uh-oh. Well, sort of the PSTN is sort of an application that runs on some exist on a sort of an existing platform and uh, does this cover like special access I mean to me there there's uh, it's just not clear it's not clear to me okay so uh, deregulation is sort of the applicant voice application level you know there's a lots of opportunities yeah. but you get below that and then there may be some market so power issues in the layer below sure. that and, and it's just not clear here where the division line is between so le let me do two things. Um, there is actually a paper that goes along with this. And the paper had a long list of ta tables of various kinds of regulations. And we rated those from one to five of how essential they are to carry forward or whether they should be abandoned. Okay? And I have a feeling, Greg, uh, if you want to sort of chirp in and shed a little bit more light on this, there really is a lot more detail, but you'll find no, no. it in the paper. No, I'm sorry, I have this not This is read like it. an 80,000 foot view, okay? Yeah, all, all I can add is that um, when you look, first of all, the FCC creates regulations. I, I had a big education at this too. I'm, I think Lisa said it, that I might be becoming a, be becoming a lawyer, but um, uh, I, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> Uh, well, but Lisa says that it's a compliment. <laughs> uh, but what, something I discovered, sir, I learned from this is that uh, FCC doesn't make the laws, it just makes regulations to support the laws. And so it really doesn't have the freedom to take away regulations that Congress says have, have to support certain laws. And so many of these regulations that we're talking about go way back to Congress as to how, how does Congress want to support communications? And, and all the things that we've talked about in this section of the, of the discussion eventually either come from Congress or they came from certain presidential directives. Um, the FCC doesn't have a lot of latitude there. So if, if we take it that that's what our country wants to do, then we just have to figure out how to do it with different types of telecommunications. Mark, and then Casey. All right. Go. Go. Okay. Uh, on the, the PSTN part, um, in the in the replacement, the moving, what you're, what we're seeing is very similar. To what's going on in the power industry as well. In the power industry, um, we had eight percent of the. And it's a regulated. You have to provide power to all the houses keep all the poles and maintain the infrastructure. PSTN's the, the same basic thing. Um, we had, as the, uh, the cost of operations became uh, too expensive and the Public Utilities Commissions wouldn't allow power companies to raise their rates, uh, they quickly ended up, we went from 8% uh, five years ago of um, cooperatives in power to now 51% of the power in the United States is delivered by cooperatives. I think what you'll see right now is that like, eight, like Verizon and other groups, such as like in West Virginia, Verizon is no longer a uh, telecommunications provider there on wireline. Uh, Verizon is uh, basically frontier communications has taken over, and Verizon's focusing primarily um, on wireless market. But that's at, if you look at West Virginia, it's one of the the um, lowest percentage of population per region for wire and telephone poles and maintenance. So, what I expect is that uh, you're going to see a lot of the um, the carriers who will eventually these PSTN lines to be supported will have to be shared across people through a cooperative to where the, since the base of the um, the cost of expenses to maintain the poles would have to be just like in the power line cooperatives would have to be shared upon the the base of the people so I, I would see the same thing as happened in the power line industry would also happen to the the phone industry that you would see more of the carriers 
going from from moving from PST, moving from supporting PSTN and also doing wireless like AT&T and Verizon, and then moving more toward the um, the wireless aspect because they go more toward wireless, they start losing on the PSTN side. So it's as you're saying that matrix when they lose, I think you're going to see cooperatives start taking that moving to a cooperative model. Interesting point, Casey. Okay, so that's kind of mind-bending discussion to trash the PSTN network, I gotta say, and I'm someone who gave up my landline like 15 years ago. I think the last time I had a landline was because my first TiVo couldn't speak Ethernet and I had to have a <laughs> phone <laughs> to connect to my TiVo database. <coughs> and then the, when, I tried, when I finally got a TiVo that did connect to the Ethernet, AT&T was gonna charge me $20 to drop my landline, so I kept it because it was gonna cost me money to ditch it. Um, but it brings up the question of what happens to phone numbers? Now, maybe that's in the paper. I haven't read the paper. I, I hope the paper's going to be public. So maybe some of this stuff is, is covered in there. But if the PS10 goes away, then phone numbers are still on cellular devices. But my understanding is that phone numbers are pretty much a total hack for cell phones and not the way that you would architect a numbering system at all. Now, this is probably going to come up momentarily when we talk about addressing for the Internet. Uh, but I just wonder if, if you've thought about the longevity of phone numbers once the PST goes away. L l let me put it this way. I mean, numbering systems, okay, and I don't think we discussed this in the group, you know, just off the cuff, numbering systems have tremendous value. Okay? And you know, what you choose to do, whether it's a domain name, uh, whether it's an IP address, uh, whether it's a phone number, that can be mapped onto the IP technology 10 ways to Sunday. Okay. okay, and I have a feeling the choice of that should probably come from the marketplace, okay, or from homogen, homo sort of the uh, homogenization of standards, etc., across the world, essentially, through you know through mechanisms like the ITU. Okay, but lots of ways of doing this. Well, I would just like to follow up on that. I've, I've always viewed numbering systems as requiring an obligation on the part of the user. Yep. If I want to use a PSTN number, there's certain obligations and requirements, some of them technical, some of them regulatory, I have to support. Similarly, if I use an internet address. Yep. Okay. So um, how does that transition? How do those obligations? Um, uh, it's, not, it's not just a number. It, it's, a, it's a token for a whole set of agreements. It's everything from an identity to a brand uh, to those agreements, essentially, right? And I have a feeling, you know, we really did not study it or spend much attention to it, but it is one of the issues that has to be addressed. It's not a data dip. It's not a data dip. No, but, you know, but, in, but, but really we're talking about a metaphysical question here, okay? <laughs> because, because in a world where transport is costless, <laughs> then the ability to go do a dip into whatever. Yeah. Is a techie will what tell you them. it is just a dip. Okay, the meaning and utility of it goes way beyond that. Well, maybe I have to come away too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so looking around the room and seeing no other upended name tags and and trying to again keep the format that we were talking about before. So, is really is it appropriate to say that the six recommendations here are actually that? In the development of a post PSTN world, colon, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. Yep. Is everybody good. comfortable with that? Yeah. David? Well, I, guess I think I'll put a caveat on it that probably as a group, we, we you know, we, we tried to be regulation light and then we're probably a little dissatisfied that we came up with so many things that should be regulated. So I think we'll probably be continuing <laughs> to, uh, to look at and solicit, and I'd like to solicit from everyone here, ideas for how to avoid this. Because I think we, you know, we, uh, and uh, I hope I'm speaking for the group, my sense is that people looked at a number of these things and said, yep, got to have that, got to have that, got to have that, um, but are, you know, perhaps not satisfied that we couldn't, you know, identify alternative ways of getting, you know, the, the Mm -hmm. as it were, the capabilities that we think the citizens are going to require. So I just, you know, throw, I don't mean to interrupt the, uh, the recommendation process, but I want to sort of throw out that request for assistance, ideas, et cetera, I suggest we take it offline, not here and now. Okay. Marvin. I wanted to throw out one other area where we have a set of regulations that uh, are based on, on 
regulatory authority over the PSTN, and that's all of the uh, issues related to communications for persons with disabilities and the issue of whether we can impose requirements on consumer terminals in an IP world. Yep. Yep, it's part, and, 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 and Doug whispers in my ear that's part of an active rulemaking. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. David. As we talk about emergency services, which I think is critical, I would also like to urge us that we not equate that with a voice product. And I think about the recent tornadoes that came through Massachusetts and the quality of television and online radar is such that the, that the local stations were saying if you live in such and such a town you have five minutes to get to your basement and if your power goes down you can come out 15 minutes after that. And they tracked the tornado, they tracked the advice basically to street level and it wasn't a voice product and it isn't a 911 product but boy was it important. So again when you talk about emergency services don't be trapped in a conception of emergency services which is the past image of 911. Okay Lynn there's your shot. You want to <laughs> Who did I hit then? I don't know what I did. <laughs> I'm sorry? You may make any observation John. I would just observe I think you know building on what David just said is that maybe there's a distinction. This is sort of an ends means discussion. I think if you if you look through you know the CFR and you find all these crazy regulations which have layered up over time, you know what they really are is evidence of certain public goods or certain needs, uh, public needs or you know which may relate to uh, serving certain populations, serving you know uh, competitive issue uh, addressing competitive issues where to uh, Dell's point maybe. You know, those were once sort of part and parcel of the whole network, but now they kind of get funneled into a certain layer on the stack as things kind of get s separated out in an IP environment. And so maybe it's worth focusing more on sort of what do the rules tell us about what are the public goods that we need to focus on, and then that opens a discussion of what's the right way to address them in a next generation uh, regulatory environment. So how does this discussion inform these recommendations? Do you want, does the body want to move forward with these recommendations? Listen, everybody jump at once. You know, I have one small other note. Yeah, no, going go back ahead. to yeah. your question, Tom, so I don't want to lose track of your question. Your question is still the right one, but just one small comment on, pay, on comment number five here, and it also probably builds, builds on Dale's comment and Marvin's, is that I did always feel like in our working group, which is a phenomenal working group, and um, great work was done here but I, I did feel like you know we are a technical working group and I, I didn't know that we're really the right ones to be saying we need to toss out these you know abandon these um, you know these these regulations and I think there's I think you know Dale made a good point about them and Marvin we you know where you know that where you know we may have missed a little here on like say special access or others and so I think it's more like the spirit of that we would hope it, you know that the the regulations would be reviewed um, in light of. Okay, um, let me see if I can edit based on that and the other comments to, to, to what so I said. So Tom, we, go if ahead. If I could yeah. just very quickly add to it. I think what we have actually done, you know, with a group like this, you can only scratch the surface of the issues. I think we have identified some. There really does need to be a serious review of the rules and regulations. And it's very complex because there are federal rules, the FCC has them, there are standard uh, standards incorporated by reference all over the place, uh, there is practice, I mean, this is multi-layered and very complex, okay? and it really deserves, I think, sort of a tiger group that really goes after this thoroughly. So if we say, in the development of the post-PSTN world, the FCC should consider, paren, mm -hmm. among others, paren, colon, yep. Yep. one through six. It is, it is not exclusive of other issues. Correct. And, and you, Adam, do you intend that your working group is going to continue to chew yeah. away at this? Yeah, and as we, as we you know, sort of reported earlier in the view graphs, uh, there is a continuation of the activity here. Okay. Everybody comfortable with that? I'm sorry, Dick, yeah. So we're wrestling over the mic. He doesn't want it, I don't either. Um, <laughs> just one 
one observation that I'd like to, to make here, and I've been, I've been quiet um, as I, I listen, but I still have a question as to what the problem is we're solving. Um, you asked it earlier by, or I think it was you, asked it when you we said, are we talking about the last mile or are we talking about the middle mile? Are we talking about the, the backhaul? Um, I, I think that there's, there needs to be more information relative to the trends that are already ongoing. Um, you may find that the, the trends are such that some of these recommendations in here are going to be addressed through the sheer um, momentum of what may already be ongoing in the industry. And so I think that there, there needs to be a way to bound that which is being solved for here, and I'm not sure I see it yet. And, and, and in fact, to that point, uh, Doug was whispering in my ear to David's point that um, the uh, ongoing activities at the Commission with regard to E911, for instance, are beyond voice and into broadcast alert systems and, and, and things such as this, to, to, to your point. And I also um, think, I mean, there's yeah. a lot of the things that are going on in terms of the carriers so Understanding that, we've had a discussion internally to try to, we were trying to find people around the table, you being one of them, Brian, and others who we'd like to have uh, participate on some of the uh, calls going forward. Right, Adam? Yeah. But, uh, but, but I'm trying to, so, so is this a suggestion to then take this off the table and come back this particular recommendation, a regulatory recommendation, off the table for this discussion and have the subcommittee play with it some more? Um, um, query, Dale. Yes, I guess it is, but, and I admit I haven't read the query. It's just, it just seems too broad for right now. It, here again, after I read the report, I might feel differently, but for right now it's, I'm a little uncomfortable. Okay. To, to that point, is, is there a plan to distribute the report? So, Doug, I thought they were in, in the hopper. Dennis's report was distributed. I, yeah, I, I know. I, I, I've, I've seen some of the back and forth drafts of this, yeah. and it's a it's a thoughtful uh, uh, document. Um, uh, is it is it yeah, ready? I mean, is I, it ready? I, are you are I you comfortable at this point in time? Yeah, Ann? we're comfortable. It's marked as a draft, but I think okay. it's ready for then distribution. Then let's let's take this group. off the table. Let's everybody yeah. chew on that report and come back in September and choose some more. Yep. Everybody comfortable? Yep. Well, this has been a, a an exhaustive discussion um, for a, an hour and 15 minutes, and I recognize the co-chairman of the working group. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can be okay with the taking it off. I'm wondering if, and it may require some after-the-fact wording, I think at least uh, saying something that, that sort of basically captures these key areas that are outlined in 1 to 6, the emergency communications of persons with disabilities. Because I think there probably is consensus that these areas need to be addressed, and at least sort of, you know, essentially putting the commission on notice of that seems okay. appropriate. So it would be. That's a what I was trying word. to do with my language that that said in the development of a post PSTN yeah. world, the FCC should commit or consider among other things, but there seemed to be some pushback on that, saying that we ought to go back and get specific, get 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 more specific with the paper on that. So I'm okay. I'm just trying to follow the will just, of the committee. Yeah, I'm here. trying to keep things moving, but uh, I'm open either way. Uh, okay, uh, uh, congratulations, you guys still own it. <laughs> uh, but this discussion, which has been an hour and fifteen minute discussion, which which the I've we've got tight time to get everything done. But these were some serious issues, protracted discussion that, that David uh, and Adam as the co-chairs of the committee and Lisa and Doug and all of the members of the committee have been really agonizing over. And our discussion here shows there's nothing easy. There's no easy lifting here. Um, so thank you, Adam, David, Doug, Lisa, everybody uh, on, the, uh, on the committee. Um, and we'll be back. Look forward to your report next time. Adam, yes, sir. So he's he's turning me, his placard up. Let me actually um, make one, one comment. Uh, 
I don't think we would have gotten as far as we did without Russ Gierek's contribution from Cisco, which is Thank the you. use of IP technology to collaborate from all over the country to get ah. this done. So Wait thank you, do you Russ. Do you mean this? Okay. <laughs> do you mean this technology stuff that we're talking about really works? Surprisingly enough. This is shocking. <laughs> thank you, Russ. Okay. Um, Charlotte Field um, from Comcast uh, was unavoidably called away at the last second, and she was chairing the IPv6 um, working group, um, and so, so she was unable to join us today. But playing the role of Charlotte today, um, John, you want to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about um, about what you're doing uh, at Comcast, and and then uh, play the role of Charlotte. Please. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Tom. I'll uh, I'll certainly try. Uh, they're 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 difficult shoes to fill. Uh, but uh, you know, as Tom said, uh, Charlotte had hoped to be uh, to be here in person. Unfortunately, she was not able to. Um, and my, my name is John Brzezowski from Comcast. She and I do quite a bit of work together. Um, and, and my role, in short, um, over the past uh, six or more years, has been leading the the technical efforts around the adoption of V6 at Comcast. Uh, you know, that, that's involved a lot of work as it pertains to not only, you know, the company and our infrastructure internally, but also doing a lot of work across the cable industry, um, including uh, work with, uh, you know, Cable Labs, uh, ITF, and other, and other types of uh, external organizations. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want, to, you know I want to definitely thank everybody here for, uh, for having me, uh, and I will certainly attempt to not to disappoint you. So um, with that, Tom, if I, uh, if I may kind of dive into... Uh, oh, we got to get through the clicker. Oh, look at Adam. Adam had the clicker for so long he thought he owned it. You know? Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. So am I ready to go? Okay, here we go. So, uh, so a little bit of background, um, and, and, and apologies if you've, uh, if, you know, if you've heard this before, but I, I figured this is a, a good, uh, as good a place as any for us to start. Um, as hopefully many of you are aware, uh, the, you know, there, you know, we have recently, uh, there's been a lot of news around the adoption of, or, or the need for the adoption of IP6 across the internet community. Uh, over, you know, approximately 40 years ago or so, uh, the IPv4 addressing scheme, which is 32-bit uh, in nature, was you know created, um, and um, it can uh, support approximately 4.2 billion you know uh, theoretical IP addresses. Um, in the late 90s, the internet community came to the realization that you know well IPv4 in the internet, you know, th this thing, it, it looks like it's uh, it's going to last. Uh, so we. Um, we started work on the next generation of the Internet Protocol, which is Internet Protocol version 6. Um, and it is basically an 128-bit an uh, addressing scheme, uh, very different in format. Uh, and again, it, it made its first uh, kind of foyer into, you know, you know in, in the, the, uh, the late 90s. And uh, it's, you know, it's been around and talked about for the better part of 15 years now. Um, as many of you may be aware, the IANA, uh, which uh, is the, the kind of the international governing body for IP resources, earlier this year, on I believe on the exact date was February 3rd, had depleted um, all remaining IPv4 address blocks uh, that it had available to allocate to regional registries. And regional registries are the organizations that serve different geographies around the world. Um, so in our region here in North America, Aaron is that is that organization uh, in Asia for example that that uh, the regional registry is referred to as APNIC um, so you know as expected uh, post the IANA depletion in the early part of February APNIC uh, in, Fe in April had announced that they had they had run uh, they had run out of their IP allocations for v4 uh, so this is the first of what is clearly the inevitable uh, announcements from each of the remaining registries where they will, they will announce their depletion of IPv4 address uh, blocks as well. 
Um, so, you know, there, there's some speculation uh, around, you know, exactly when, and, and, and to some extent it's not, it's not material as to exactly when. It will be, we, we all know it will happen. Uh, but we expect, you know, perhaps uh, Europe could, could experience uh, this depletion later this year and then ultimately North America sometime in 2012, uh, maybe even sooner. The, uh, the, the IP6 working group here is part of the TAC. Uh, one of the things that we had kind of, uh, re you know, visited or discussed a number of times is, you know, what, what does this impact mean, right? So um, some folks had, uh, you know, had been preparing for the adoption of V6. Uh, a great many, however, have not. Um, so one of the things that, um, that we felt was very important to call out, particularly in this venue, is to, in, in, to, to make sure that people understand that the delay or the absence of the, the adoption of V6 is most certainly going to have uh, some impacts. Um, a lot of folks, you know, that, that I talk to or, or that, that kind of speak out loud about V6 things in general uh, seem to sometimes think that just simply not deploying V6 is, is, a, is a valid option. But the fact of the matter is, is by, by not deploying V6, you you kind of make some indirect decisions, and some of those include the, the sharing or the multiplexing of IPv4 addresses. So this is basically where, you know, uh, you and your neighborhood could potentially be sharing a single public IPv4 address to, to gain access to IPv4 resources on the Internet. Um, there have been a number of discussions within the community um, and, and law enforcement that, that highlight uh, some of the challenges associated with address sharing. Um, basically, this is often referred to as large-scale NAT. Uh, so there are obviously security and, and potential legal challenges that, that, that folks could face, and ultimately the end-user experience. Uh, you, you can imagine that um, you know, sharing what used to be a resource that was you know, dedicated to your home or in use in your home is now, uh, you know, and, and now finding it being used by your entire neighborhood. Um, you know, th there could be some end-user experiences there, and, and we felt that that was something that was very important uh, for for this group to take note of. John, let me just, uh, one uh, background piece of information since, since you um, weren't able to be here, but uh, at our first meeting, um, now nine months ago, uh, this body spent more time talking about IPv6 than any other <coughs> topic. Probably half of the time was all about IPv6. So I, th I think it, it, you, can, you can operate on the assumption that you have an IPv6 informed group that you're talking about. That's great news, Tom. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, so I, w with that said, you know, that, that really was the only intro slide that we had here as far as that is concerned. Uh, we're going to start diving into some, some more recent uh, you know, information and events here. So one of the things that, that, that we found as part of the discussion is, is there are, um, you know, the, the awareness around the importance of V6 has certainly increased uh, over the past year, maybe two years, uh, we find that there are a great many more service providers that are, are aware of the need. Um, uh, we, we think that, you know, g given the state of their, you know, of their deployment plans, you know, I think uh, we found that there, there are different levels of awareness, uh, but, but awareness nonetheless is important. Uh, we've also found that through, through some efforts that we've, that, you know, that we've all been, you know, th that have been kind of, in, you know, actively taking place within the community that there is also awareness increasing in, in other areas of, uh, across the industry. So consumer electronics uh, re and retailers are, are two very good examples. So we found that there is an increasing population of devices that support uh, V6, you know, it's, it's really just there. Um, and we've, you know, we've also found that there is, uh, is, a, is a, a higher level of awareness within the retail community. So we're talking about the, the best buys, the, you know, the Walmarts of the world. Uh, one of the things that mm -hmm. is, is uh, you know, maybe most notable, um, and, and probably you, you've all seen in the news, was uh, World IPv6 Day. So World IPv6 Day uh, really was a 24-hour period of time that occurred uh, <coughs> between, uh, you know, zero UTC on June 8th and ended at 11.59 UTC on June 8th. And it was really a day where um, uh, that, that was largely focused on content. However, companies like Comcast had had been uh, very active in, in participating in, in World V6 Day. But it really was a 24-hour test drive of IP6 where uh, some of the largest content providers uh, around the world had decided to, uh, to simultaneously turn on support for IP6, uh, but also they decided to largely turn it off after that 24-hour period of time. Um, so there were, there were obviously some corner cases, uh, and, and just one side note. Um, as far as World V6 Day was concerned, so it originally started off with a with a handful of companies, and I think after the day was done, there were there were several hundred, um, perhaps approaching a thousand companies that had uh, 
that had uh, that had you know decided to participate in this day. So this was this is significant, and uh, you'll find that um, the awareness that was generated from it was also quite material, not only within the technical community, but also within you know you know the lay community as well. You know you know regular end users who are generally um, not interested in, 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 in how the internet works. Um, the you know there there were some cases that we uh, that that were observed during this day where and, and this again was a very 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 small percentage of the overall participants where they found that they had some issues enabling v6 um, on their internet property so this is more on the content side and um, and uh, but but we found that even those folks who had experienced some some issues or or, or some or some challenges uh, it was a an, a an extraordinary learning experience for them so they were able to take those findings away and learn from them and uh, fold them into you know the their normal day to day as far as supporting v6 um, generally speaking we found that the during world v6 day um, there, there were many high level objectives that we all you know that, that we all had hoped to to see occur um, each of the participants really had their own set of expectations um, you know the most important of which uh, two of which were um, making sure that nothing nothing went wrong and secondly, um, for others, it was to make sure that the usage of V6 increased during this period of time, which in fact was the case. So we found that um, that uh, most most participants did report a significant increase in the in the utilization or the usage of IP6. And one final note about World V6 Day or World IP6 Day is um, there is kind of loose discussion around uh, round two uh, for World V6 Day, and perhaps. Um, you know, we, we expect that this would occur sometime in the in the in the first half of 2012. Um, not, nothing has been solidified, and then um, the, the the talk also suggests that perhaps the uh, World V6 Day turns into World V6 Week, or something a little bit longer than 24 hours. So you know, given given that the you know the the success that we had on June 8th, uh, it seems that uh, that that there is interest to doing it again and doing it for a longer period of time. And the issues that this tees up for this committee or what, John? Oh. I'm sorry, Tom, could you repeat your question? So the issues that that tees up for this committee, I'm just trying to make sure we got, I'm, I'm trying to watch the clock here and make sure yeah. that we get a chance to, to, to debate the recommendations that you have, but their recommendations aren't for like another half a dozen slides. Right, so so ultimately, Tom, how this how this feeds into the V6 working group will be in, in, in three key areas. Uh, some of the recommendations and guidelines uh, that, I, that I'm hoping Walter can make a few comments on. Uh, some of the cost-benefit uh, analysis as it relates to the adoption of E6. Great. And then ultimately as it relates to benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking, we've outlined uh, quite a bit of information here within, within, this, within this deck as what we think make sense as far as metrics to measure so that we not only know, uh, you know what areas to focus on but what areas are material to determine a successful transition to V6. Great. Let's let's hit those. Okay. Uh, so so do you want me to kind of skip ahead and if jump you, right to yeah, some of this? If, if you can, yeah. Sure. Please. Um, that's no problem. So what I'll do, Walter, uh, and then uh, Tom, is I will jump forward to some of the issues. So we're going to go to slide number six. Great. Yep. So um, throughout some of the discussions that we've had as part of the V6 working group, uh, there are some, some there, there are a number of concerns that we've you know that, that and challenges that we've highlighted. Um, some of them include uh, requirements, you know, uh, kind of diversity uh, requirements, diversity amongst different would-be adopters. So basically, this points back to uh, you know you know a very broad set of requirements that potentially could become challenging as far as you know vendors are concerned. Um, and of course, th these naturally are going to be based. Um, they're going to differ from adopter to adopter, and they're all contextually relevant. Um, there's a lot of there, there's some uncertainty around you know uh, what what's going to get built and by whom, uh, and then ultimately around uh, what end users um, you know uh, th their perception of things as far as V6 is concerned. Some of the other issues at a high level, Tom, are um, you know that that we all recognize that the the the, the lack of V4 addressing during the transition could potentially impact um, you know new entrants. And of course, you know um, some uh, a potential absence of strategic plan uh, across, you know, all the all the different sectors uh, is, uh, is is an overarching concern as well. So, from a TAC point of view, um, we recognize that uh, as part of the V6 working group, that um, as a result of this transition, or perhaps you know the lack thereof in some cases, um, that that the internet could become 
a bit more complex. Um, and, and because the, the transition could occur over a, a, an extended period of time, um, and you'll see later that we, we draw some analogies as it relates to uh, Y2K, um, you know, this, this is uh, an added area that, that we thought was worth uh, calling out. It, you know, I, I think we'd all agree that the, uh, the Internet is, uh, is, is, is foundational to, to U.S. innovation. And of course, um, one of the things that we do call out here is how does that affect our ability, you know, to, you know, to be competitive, not only in the near term but also in the long term, and uh, and ultimately we wish, you know, we, we, we really do think it's it's uh, advantageous to, to to minimize the the period of complexity and ultimately shorten the transition period. So moving on to slide number eight. So here are some of our objectives. We we outline our objectives here. We have. Um, at least two key areas identified here. We have our benchmarking piece, which identifies um, areas uh, and metrics of V6 preparedness across different sectors. We'll, we'll talk about those here in a few minutes. And ultimately talk about track trackable uh, measures of progress. And, uh, and ultimately techniques as to how some of that data can be acquired and measured. Now, uh, what one point to note about, about this data acquisition piece is we, we certainly do not aim to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and um, or, or claim that we could we could do it better. So wherever possible, we will recycle uh, information or tools that are available to us today. And then ultimately, uh, the the um, the the other goal here is to is to outline some recommendations to improve the path of evolution and again you know reduce the transition period. All right, so moving on to <coughs> slide number nine. So this is where we are outlining the high level metrics. As, uh, as part of the benchmarking subgroup of the V6 working group. We highlight uh, a handful of areas here, consumer electronics, network support for V6, end users, applications, content, services, and traffic levels. One of the things that we, we did feel as a group that was very important to note is that there are, there are very distinct relationships between each of these, each of these metrics. Um, a, a, a delay or absence in one could actually have a, a, a macro effect on the overall transition to V6. So it's, uh, you know, it's analogous to kind of not having all your stars in alignment, for example. So um, you know, having, having an area where, say, you know, consumer electronics, and, and just as an example, uh, you know, just say we had you know, lacking support for V6 uh, in this area, you know, even if you had networks or service providers and ultimate content that, ha that were available for V6, um, if, if people who are in their homes do not have the tools or the technology to consume it, uh, to consume the same over V6, um, then it's, it, it, it will be somewhat, some, you know, somewhat problematic. So we'll, uh, we'll do a drive-by here on each of those areas at a very high level uh, so that folks can understand exactly what it is that we were after as it relates to uh, some, of the, some of the detailed data or the, met or, or, the, or the specifics around each of these um, measurable items. So from consumer electronics point of view, uh, you know, this, this includes making sure that, you know, your home networking equipment um, supports V6. Uh, again, this has a play as far as, re you know, retail is concerned. Want to make sure that, you know, when, when my mom goes into Best Buy, that she could pick any, any device off the shelf and, uh, and it'll support V6. Um, you know, in, in premise device support V6. So we're talking about your computers, your uh, smartphones, your webcams, your TVs, your whatevers. Uh, again, making sure that there is a, a, a metric in place to make sure that, that we understand what percentage of these devices being made available today support V6. And then ultimately, one of the most popular and probably um, important uh, devices are obviously computer operating systems. Uh, so there are a number of ways that we can kind of collect this information and, and we'll get into that as, as part of uh, some of our subsequent work. From a network point of view, slide number 11, um, support for V6 by service provider, and then ultimately by type of provider. So this goes from broadband to wireless, you know, tier one support. Um, we, we, we put in here some information about, um, you know, assessing the, the number of ASNs that advertise support for V6, and then ultimately uh, categorizing some of the impediments that we find or feel that are relevant as it relates to uh, the adoption of V6. Uh, so things like, um, you know, different types of, of, you know, access network equipment that perhaps um, is, is, is limiting the ability of, of operators to, to deploy and support IP6. And we'll move on to slide number 12, end user support. So this is, uh, this ties back to the example I just provided a few minutes ago, where it is simply the intersection 
of, of, of some of the very key variables here. You know, if, uh, if an end user um, does not have the right consumer electronics or they, do not, they don't have a service provider that supports V6 or the, or the content or services that they wish to consume do not support V6, then ultimately it has, it has a impactful, um, it, it does impact the end user experience uh, directly. Slide number 13. Uh, this one is, uh, is, is pretty straightforward in nature, where we talk about uh, assessing the support for V6 within applications. So these are things that probably many of us and many of our families use on a daily basis, everything from browsers and email clients, uh, and of course, making sure that, that you know, we have a clear understanding and metric around uh, support for V6 in those. Uh, and, and this will absolutely tie back to, um, or tie forward to one of the slides we have here uh, ahead uh, about the different traffic types. Uh, each one of these applications that supports V6 will in turn yield um, you know, an increase in traffic um, of the various types. And content and services, slide number 14. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of this in, uh, in, in, in towards the end of the deck here, but making sure that there is there's, there's a clear understanding of support for V6 across the government, educational, commercial, not-for-profit, and then ultimately having having a measure that says you know this is the percent um, per category of support for IP6, um, and then of course what percentage of traffic each of these categories represents, and then traffic levels slide number 15. Uh, I believe this is the last of our uh, of kind of the, the particulars around the different metrics, and this is uh, again this is this is one area where we are we're fairly certain that there's quite a bit of information available today. And this is not only uh, aggregate global traffic as it relates to you know v4 versus v, you know versus v6, but also from a national level. Um, you know what what sort of increase are we seeing over time, and then of course on a per provider basis uh, is something that we feel will be will be interesting to to measure. So moving on, if there are no questions about each of the metrics, uh, we'll dive into the, the the final two slides here, talk about some recommendations, and then ultimately some next steps. Um, sure, I could do that. Um, if you, you I, I think it's important because the adoption rate is so low. Yes. That maybe shocked some people. Yeah. 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 So what I'll do, if you don't mind, and, and I, I, I can't see your, your card, um, sure. Harold. Um, we, um, current, the question was about current traffic levels. What we're seeing now is the overall, the, the V6 traffic compared to the traffic of the overall internet is, is sub 1%. Uh, and and, I th and, uh, and it's actually it's actually probably sub uh, you know a half a percent to some extent you know in, in you know d depending on which on which metric but it is very low uh, to Harold's point and uh, clearly is something that um, is uh, it is very important to take note of and it's something that should help folks in the room understand um, what the current state of adoption is and uh, clearly that's a needle that we need to move forward. Um, so moving on to slide number 16 as far as potential recommendations are concerned. So some of the very high level recommendations that, that we had um, highlighted here would be, uh, you, know, you, know, uh, you know, leveraging the government as a catalyst for the, v the, the transition to V6. So not only setting a date by which when um, all, all government internet properties will be, will support V6 and, and what, you know, what, we, uh, what the recommendation here would be is uh, native dual stack. Um, you know, a V6 only internet property at this time is is certainly not advisable. And then ultimately, um, you know, giving the you know the, the the influence that the government has from a purchasing point of view, ensuring that uh, all the government vendors and 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 contractors uh, understand that V6 is a is a very important uh, requirement from a government point of view. I know that from you know you know from different operators and, and different uh, adopters' point of view, uh, this has been a very effective mechanism to ensure that that ultimately uh, we all have the tools that we need to deploy V6. Um, following that would be uh, setting some national objectives for the transition, um, the V6 tradition, uh, transition across sectors. So perhaps outlining some timelines um, for government and industry objectives, and of course developing uh, the benchmarking information um, that we could use to, to measure uh, the progress and ultimately our success. Um, and, and one very important goal that I think we all, that we all feel uh, strongly about is making sure that we minimize the transition. Um, you know, at this time, you know, because, you know, uh, and actually we, we blew by the slide earlier, um, and this was, uh, you know, care of, care of Walter, um, V6 uh, is not an event, but an evolution. Uh, one of the things that, um, 
you know, that, that, that we talked about as it relates to that is unlike the year 2000, uh, which had a very fixed point in time, IPv6 will, will almost certainly occur over an extended period of time. Um, so one of the things that we feel is, is very important as a recommendation is to, is to minimize that. Uh, so again, increasing awareness, you know, part, of, part of the reason for, for you know, our participation here, as well as uh, sharing important information and learnings, and then ultimately um, encouraging collaboration amongst uh, you know, key stakeholders. Can I just ask just a question for clarification? Sure. So if the traffic is as low as, as you're describing, John, uh, what, what would you expect the tipping point to be on the transition where there's enough critical mass that people start to pay attention? Because as you pointed out with Y2K, I mean, there really was a forcing function. But here it seems like there's no real forcing function. You just nat everything, right? So, Peter, the, we, we believe that, um, that the tipping point or the, maybe the forcing function for, the, uh, for kind of a, an accelerated transition to V6 will be um, something that we call that on the very early slides, right? So, so th there, are, there, are, there are two scenarios. You can deploy IPv6 or basically you, you will have to start to share right. IPv4 addresses. As that has its impact on end users and subscribers and experience and, 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 the, and the challenges associated with that begin to, to mount and um, simply become um, unwise investments in time and effort, um, you'll find that um, you know, v, V6 will, will, will just look that much more attractive, right? Um, and, and unfortunately, it, it may take, in some cases, some people to experience mm -hmm. that, that, uh, that discomfort to, to realize that um, the V6 is very important to, to the future of, of you know of their of their, of their companies. So, um, it, you know, I, I think what you're finding is that there are a lot more people today that already are aware of this. They've they've seen and heard about some of the findings and testing that's occurred with some of this address sharing, mm -hmm. and understand that um, it is it is not optimal and and um, it's it does not represent a long term investment uh, from from an infrastructure point of view. Thanks. Sure. Well. I, let me just add one of the, it's, it's a little bit more complex even than that. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with a lot of people. Um, uh, there's been great care put into ensuring that people with IP4 addressing are minimally impacted. So one of the concerns, in fact, we had a discussion uh, at the last meeting with Vince Cerf where he was uh, suggesting that in the dual environment you could coexist ad infinitum for a very, very long period of time. Um, and one of the things I can tell you, having looked at this, is that the there's a perception of cost and 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 benefit. That uh, concerns we're seeing right now are that um, there's no hard benefits driving a quick transition. Maybe that's wrong. There's a, there's some discussion that IPv6 has benefits. We just don't understand them yet. But but clearly, we I, I think the concern what 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 the work group is coming back with. Um, is first of all, uh, it's a national perspective, and I want to distinguish that. A lot of the what you hear about the internet is global, the internet as a whole. Um, the concern originally expressed here, and the concern is what is the U.S. doing? What is the national competitiveness of the U of the U.S.? Um, and the concern is that we're going into an environment in which the internet's going to get becoming more complex for a long period of time. How long um, is debatable? Um, and uh, the recommendations basically break down to uh, we need a holistic view of where we stand today and the rate of progress over time of where things are changing and maybe more importantly where things are not changing. And secondly, a recommendation that there should be clear targeted goals set by government and industry to help guide uh, the situation and help form policy that would minimize the transition period in a way that's beneficial. Thank you. Yeah, Jesse. I, t I tell you what, let's let's let John let's let John finish and then let's come back because I think there's a flood of issues that get opened up when he hits his last slide. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Walter. What, one, one thing to add to Walter's comment is something that um, that we would have touched on earlier. Um, is, is also, you know, we, we've had some discussion with folks from like uh, machine to machine computing environments, and uh, you know, certainly the, the the message there or the the learnings from those discussions have been um, something to the effect of you know how how the absence of V6 or the the um, the, you know, the expanded use of address sharing could adversely affect innovation in those areas, right? So going back to the point about competitive advantage and innovation here in the states, uh, very important variable to consider. 
Um, so let's see here. Oh, how do I get back to the slides? All right, so I, I do have, okay, one last slide here. Um, so um, just outlining some of the, the next steps here. Uh, we're going to continue to, uh, you know, we're going to expand the vetting of the, some, some, of the, some of the output from the working group here, particularly from a benchmarking point of view uh, with some key industry and government groups. Uh, we feel that we want to make sure that we, that, that we are very thorough um, as, far as, uh, as far as kind of outlining what these, what these metrics are and then ultimately identify, uh, you, know, you know, owners for each of these areas moving forward. Uh, there's also some recommendations and guidelines output that we are, uh, that we are expecting. Um, and then, you know, there's some outstanding questions about, um, um, you know, agreements between, you know, key government groups on, on, on you know, leadership roles and opportunities there. So um, can we go back to your, your recommendations <laughs> slide for a second? Because I think that's probably where we need to be focusing, right? Sure. Um, so, so would it be correct to say that bullet one um, uh, about uh, the, the need for there to be um, uh, government to be a catalyst. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge there is that you have government as uh, a purchaser mm -hmm. and you have government as a regulator. First one's pretty clear cut and, and the administration has started down that path. Mm -hmm. The second one is a serious question of regulatory authority, whether, for instance, this body has regulatory authority in TIA or anybody, uh, and the interface of that question with the broader issue of, um, uh, of the U.S. as a member of the world community and the position that we have taken in international bodies um, that we support the supranational structures and oppose regulation of the internet mm -hmm. um, and and how do we balance those out becomes the challenge that this body faces for recommendation one is that is that a fair assessment I think it is Tom I mean I think I think the, that that balance is a, is a difficult one and um, you know what one of the things that uh, is probably worth you know highlighting is that we've you know, we, we've seen, you know, we, you know, we've seen a lot more activity in this space, you know, and, and, and we've had some healthy discussions within within the group about, you know, what really um, needs to happen from a government point of view, particularly as it relates to regulation. And I think, um, you know, um, you know I, I think what you said was spot on and that, you know, that that's a difficult balance and, and certainly the preference would be to 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 not have to uh, to regulate. So the uh, the other thing that perhaps um, I think you, you put into um, into uh, you, you know maybe you kind of you, you kind of fit into the procurement piece, but also you know government government internet properties um, are probably uh, are, are more certainly popular you know as popular content right. And so I mean right. um, you know given that it's uh, you know it's it's available to you know to uh, you know, all of our end users here across the United States, and you know you guys probably know better than I would as to what those statistics are. Um, you know enabling that content to be you know supporting V6. Um, would also be quite um, powerful as far as a for instance the FCC website does not support v6 for example <laughs> yes. just to pick one at random and uh, well, there was there was one I think to the IT people by the way we have tested it we just haven't implemented it now there there is one there, there's one point here that I that I call out um, I, I pulled uh, I pulled some information from a, from a meeting that was held last last fall and uh, the CIO of uh, the United States I believe had a uh, had uh, put some sort of a date uh, out there for September of 2012, right. and uh, you know somebody keep me honest if I have it wrong. Uh, so you know, assuming that that uh, you know, that's that, that that is in fact the case, that that's uh, that's certainly a step in the right direction. Let me let me sure. add one point to that. I just it's there is a 2012 date. There's also a 2014 date because um, it's an evolving technology. So this is not you know, <laughs> jumping over the stick once. It's making an investment towards uh, towards an end goal. I think the interesting thing to me, listening to the work group and listening also to some of the people beyond the work group in, in the TAC, was that a belief that government should be doing something, whether it's regulation or a lighter touch, in terms of helping to accelerate a transition, creating awareness of the issues, and, and setting uh, meaningful objectives across different industry groups. Uh -huh. So Walter, one, one comment to that. Um, 
you know, 2012, 2014, and you know, it wasn't too long ago. There was a 2008 in there somewhere. Um, and um, you know, the, the one thing that I can tell you as somebody who firsthand is is uh, is, is is kind of helping us to at, at least in the cable community get there. Um, you know, one one very good way for the for for the government to participate is um, you know, technology is not going to ready itself, right? Uh, so you know, so making sure that the government is asking for it, understanding its requirements, and driving that back into you know, ultimately the vendor community and and the different aspects, is a is a is a significant way um, for the government to participate in, uh, in 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 shortening the transition period. Okay, Jesse, then Casey, then David. Uh, th thanks, Tom. Just back to Walter's point and maybe John's as well. I guess what I was expecting to hear out of this group, I really didn't get and. Let me just frame that and, and maybe I'm missing it. I thought based on a lot of discussions we've had in earlier sessions that this was a, a major issue. We certainly, and I don't want to disagree with Vince, I think we do understand the dual stack that you can certainly run transition for a very long period of time. What I was hoping was that the group was coming back with a clear set of recommendations of dates certain similar to the past group of when we would move from IVV4 as a primary uh, addressing scheme to IBV6 as the primary addressing scheme. Not saying that you would completely dismantle all the systems that are out there that, that are IPv4 enabled. The issue that, that from a wireless communications point of view, which is where I spend most of my time, is that we're seeing applications growing at an exponential rate uh, and that if you start to look at new applications like energy management systems, building management systems that are running off of wireless networks, the number of endpoints also are going to grow at an exponential rate. And that what I was hoping we were going to come back with as a recommendation, at least what I was expecting, was a date certain where we would move from V4 being primary to it being secondary and IPv6 being primary and being led by the government that says that we're going to do that and here's the date certain by which we're going to do that and that we would recommend that uh, the commercial sector follow suit. I mean, that's what I was hoping to hear, and I, I guess I was trying to understand what prohibited you from getting to a point like here's a date certain. Yep. So, so Jesse, if I if I can make one comment there, so the transition to V6, uh, you know, yeah, again to kind of plagiarize Walter here a little bit, you know, it's it's a it's an evolution, right? It's not it's not something that we can that's going to happen like like uh, Y2K, for example, um, from. From a from a transition point of view, the expectation here is that we that there's an interim step before we divorce ourselves completely from IP4, right? And the interim step is to is to begin to introduce IP6, very very similar to how many companies have started to do it already, to, to do that already. Ultimately, to arrive at a place where uh, we can we can cut the cord, right? Not only as the government, but also as you know as, you know you know folks in, in in commercial endeavors, right? We can we can get to a place where we no longer require IPv. Uh, IPv4, uh, because the, the painful reality is, is as the as the traffic uh, levels that we cited earlier indicate, the vast majority of the internet is still IPv4, in, 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 you know, you know, in, in, uh, oriented, right? So, so you're not um, apologies, for, you know, and, and we'll take that back to the working group as uh, you know, as far as your expectations are concerned, to help outline, you know, when when we think we can put that on paper. But ultimately, the objective here is to make sure that we we do this in a seamless manner, right? We don't want anybody to. We, we were the, the the goal here is to also have this not be to, to be minimally disruptive, right? No, no I, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I certainly understand that and appreciate your comment. Uh, all I was uh, the point I was uh, making was that if you look at machine to machine type communications, you look at these new applications uh, that are being driven from a wireless perspective and the growth of wireless communications, as well as the hosting of applications in the network, as we go to a flat uh, IP based network. I just think that, that we ought to, from a leadership point of view in the U.S., that we should say this is the date by which we're going to drive this conversion and take more of a leadership position in it as opposed to letting it happen. I mean, let's, let's ask Walt to. Uh, to in fairness yeah. to you, th this, this point was actually discussed. And okay. Many, many okay. people indicated that, that they would like to see a date certain. In fact, they made analogies to the digital television transition. Sure. Okay. The reality is it's a governance issue. Um, that might be a goal coming out of an indu of a industry government collaboration, but we recognize that this group is doesn't have the authority. The okay. FCC okay. itself doesn't have the authority to say 2018 is the is the date du jour. We we didn't have the the, the responsibility to say 2018. So um, uh, we 
punted and said that setting national goals should be an objective of the government working with industry and that we need to focus on this more as an issue of what are we trying to do with this important infrastructure. Okay. Casey. Oh, did you have yours up first? I, <laughs> I, I turned my card a while ago because I wanted to bring up an issue that several of you have subsequently alluded to, which I think is important to this, which is the interplay between national goals and the international character of IPv6. And I, in particular, when you get to a goal of minimizing the transition period, it seems to me that one of the things that, the, that we should put as background to recommendations is, in fact, how effective national initiatives can be in the context of the larger international scope. Does it actually work for the U.S. to set a national objective with, uh, set a deadline, uh, date certain, with respect to shortening the transition time as a unilateral national action? And I understand that the FCC is a national facing organization, but we need that information in order to write recommendations that are rational and will actually be believable because people aren't going to do something if they don't believe it's actually going to work. And so it seems to me this work has to be positioned within a, a presumption of the international space and our ability to separate ourselves, which could in the end be again a possible uh, place where technical alternatives could help us. And if we wanted to preserve national innovative advantage, we may discover that some, some international insulation is something we should explicitly try to accomplish. So. So, so, I'm sorry, David. Can, can I make one comment to, to David? So, David, the you know, I, I think that's part of what we had, you know, what, what at least I was, I was trying to, uh, you know, convey in response to one of the one of the earlier comments is that, you know, the, the government as uh, as as as, you know, as a as an entity that has enormous amount of influence, if they if they act, you know, if if there's a plan in place to actually turn it on and use it with confidence, um, the, the the amount of readiness and and uh, and, uh, and and progress forward. Is significant, you know, on that front, right? I mean, I can tell you that from our point of view, the actual, the actual statement that we were going to use it and turn it on was very material, right? And and it no, you know, it's regulation free, right? You know, it's basically, you know, it's something that we knew that we had to do to support our business. Jason. Uh, okay, so I have a slightly different perspective than, than John does on the forcing function. I think Peter nailed it on the head. There was no forcing function for IPv6. In fact, there's kind of a counter-forcing function now because the cooperative self-regulatory regime that's been handing out IPv4 addresses for the last 20 years decided toward the end that the, the best way to, quote, accelerate the transition to V6 would be to allow people to buy and sell IPv4 addresses in the interim to sort of, I don't know, grease the wheels. I never really understood the reasoning, and it's a debate that's been going on for three years, if not 13 years, on whether IPv4 addresses or IP addresses, period, can or should be owned. But regardless, it, the inevitable decision was made that now you can buy and sell them. And Microsoft just spent $100 million or something on a big chunk of, of IPv4 addresses from Nortel in bankruptcy proceedings. So the fact that they've now institutionalized a valuable market for IPv4 addresses, these are now going to become assets on the books. And that's going to be a strong counter function to deploying IPv6. The carriers now have a disincentive, as if they didn't already have a disincentive, because it costs so damn much. And it's not like they get to draw a spreadsheet where they can be in some short number of years within their time horizon of business planning can be supporting V6 and not V4. V4 is not going away in any time horizon these guys have. So it's basically support V4 with complex NAT junk that Cisco's already building, <laughs> or support V4 with complex NAT junk that Cisco's already building and support V6. That's their option. So I mean, what would you do? So that's why I think that it's not, and, I, and so Jesse also nailed it. It's not going to happen without a date. In fact, the last time we did a network layer transition like this was what? Dave was there. It was NCP, right? 1980. Four? Four? And it took, two, it took two flag days. And it was a forcing function. It was, if you don't do it, if you don't turn off NCP and turn on TCP, you'll get no money. You'll get, you're not, you won't get your next DARPA money. <laughs> and it still took two days to do two different six months separated, I think. Yes, you made it not work. You could, like, not and work. that's how. What, that's what it took for digital TV. You had to make it illegal to use analog, right? So I don't really see the FCC or any other government agency making IP4 illegal in my lifetime. But I don't see another. I don't see another function for IPv6 to okay. happen. So that's a that's concern. That's really thought. Show ahead, uh, and then our winner. All right. I, I guess um, to Walter's point, yes, I agree that <laughs> FCC can't uh, insert its heavy hand. But I guess one idea would be to. Um, being a marketing agent for IPv6 in that I've seen other 
regulators around the world um, also espousing to push IPv6 in their own countries, uh, they, they effectively became a marketing engine to push this agenda forward. And you don't have to have regulations, you don't have to have policies, but you could just be, you know, maybe in your website just say IPv6, this is a uh, interoperable site, or, you know, have the training and education behind it. I think that could be as effective as putting a policy together. Good. Um. Respect to the, the future of IPv4, you know, I, as I see it, there there are large ISPs who have inventory of you know, literally millions and millions of IPv4 addresses, uh, and can continue to issue IPv4 addresses for for quite a number of years going forward. Uh, and then there are a number of small ISPs, many I, small ISPs uh, that have precious few uh, IPv4 addresses available. You know, now, now one solution is just to allow the smaller ISPs to buy addresses, but now you're asking the small ISPs to buy those addresses from the big ISPs, who in many cases they compete with, you know, at ever escalating prices. So you're taking money out of the pocket of the little guys and you're giving it to the big guys. Uh, in addition to that, the little guys are the ones that are facing the transition immediately in the next you know, 12, 24, 36 months. They either have to go solve the dual stack problem, you know, or you know, the, 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 the carrier grade NAT problem uh, and have to do it at a reasonably high scale. And so with, with, without some sort of regulatory intervention, it seems like we're evolving into kind of an ugly situation, you know, uh, and it seems like it, without, it seems somebody's going to have to step in and say, you know, we can't just put the, both the financial burden and the engineering burden on the small ISPs, you know, we have to have some sort of, you know, of national approach to, to get this problem solved. Okay, we've got less than uh, an hour left for two more uh, groups. Jesse, I'm going to do you, and then, and then and I'm going to only limit it to the members of the committee. Go ahead, Jesse. No, Tom, I just wanted to make the, the point, I think Casey hit it on the head, in terms of new entrants, where we're creating new applications, where you have limited the, those groups, and I, I think it was made back there as well, have limited IP addresses today, but we have a rich set of new applications that we want to bring to the marketplace. And if we've got to go to the established entities, which is what's happening today, because there's no more IPv4 addresses, it limits our ability to bring these new applications to market. That's really the point I was trying to make, right? So, so let's see, and it's, uh, you know, somebody told me the other day that Ford Motor is sitting on 25 million addresses. The U.S. Postal Service has <laughs> exactly. 16 million addresses that they're sitting on. I mean, it's an amazing situation, and somebody, to Casey's point, is going to do this with them. Um, let's see if we can take the kind of things, John, that, that the group has, uh, has been talking about and structure them in a way that we can bring forward out of this group. Um, so I, w I, I would put forward a, a slight rephrasing of the recommendations in, in, into two parts. One, that, that we recommend to the FCC chairman that he take the initiative with NTIA, who is the leader in the executive branch, remembering the FCC is not, is an independent agency, not part of the executive branch, that with NTIA and the White House to encourage and facilitate the transition, including aspirational target dates, government and government conversion, is about as close to a forcing mechanism as we can come. But that what is absent here is that there are multiple parts of the, of the U.S. government who are touching this issue that need to pull together and deliver the kind of message that Shahed was talking about uh, and, and to, 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 to take leadership and, and deliver the message. So that's part one. Part two would be that that the TAC move forward and that the working group move forward on this benchmarking activity because if TAC on its own unilateral authority can come up with a, an approach to benchmarks to measure those various subgroups that you had listed, those half a dozen subgroups you had listed there, John, that will be a significant contribution to number one. Reaction to, to that? I, I, I thought your, your description was very crisp. I thought it was very strong. I, I want to just add one build to it, but I like all of it, which is that I, mean, you, you, I think why we all got so excited about IPv6 at the first meeting was you really encouraged.
encouraged us at that meeting to think about jobs creation. Right. And so I think as we all thought about like where is there uncertainty out there this was a top area where there's uncertainty and i think whenever there's uncertainty there's confusion mis or misinformation lack of coordination and it's the le that's the less investment you get the less jobs and so i think we all liked moving this to a more certain position and so i think the one build i would add in your area in, in what you said is that i would um i would add that the fcc could also encourage voluntary efforts you know, like things like say, um, like, like, and this is just an example. We don't have to do this one, but things like say a seal, an IPv6 seal of approval. You know, when when things are IPv6 compliant, whether it's a website or a piece of consumer electronics gear, it's just it's just a thought. We can debate and discuss that one, or it can be debated and discussed elsewhere. But I think, um, you know, I think that it seems to fit well with, um, you know, with with. You know, with, with that kind of thought. I just made that the third mm -hmm. bullet. Under okay. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that? Is the Tom, Tom for a little bit of levity, yeah, Peter. You, I just learned something new. We could actually advance the agenda of making the post office solvent <laughs> by increasing the value of IPv4 addresses. So. <laughs> that's very next. Popular. That's the next one. Exactly. That's right. That's right. Do they have any spectrum? So, so let's just <laughs> let's just get this let's just get this straight. So. So if the internet is putting the post office out of business, therefore the post office turns around and sells its internet go. assets. Uh, any other discussion on, uh, on this? Dennis, Dick, you guys have 42 minutes. And it's, and it's his swan song. So uh, you get 40 minutes, then. I'll, I'll move along, and I have grabbed the, the precious commodity of the, the clicker here in advance. There are a couple of obligatory slides, the, the charter, which is the focus on sharing not only of spectrum, but also of infrastructure, the initial task, the, the, the group I will pause on because this has been a very hard working group. Selected members of the group have put in tremendous hours well into the well into the night in some cases to produce the, the various results and papers that we've passed along to you all. So kudos to the group for their hard labors. The five areas that we have been focused on are listed here. Effectively, they're divided into two chunks. One through three are spectrum oriented and four and five are infrastructure oriented. What you'll see is that we have chosen to merge uh, items one and two and in the process helped some number of you who were very concerned about receiver standards not being standards so the standards no longer exists in fact we've obliterated the whole idea number two so you should be quite happy with the the elimination of the standards it was always guidelines so pr people properly pointed out that we weren't getting into the the standards business in the in the FCC moving into this uh, the using the format from last time and in fact largely replicating the the slide from last time um, our efforts in the first idea spectrum efficiency uh, which has a long-term opportunity impact uh, to Tom's focus on the, the, the status of these items the the focus here is on determining how we can both identify and enhance the efficiencies and understanding that there is no single metric there is a need for metrics that that are fit for purpose that's been our focus we have begun that process and we'll get to that in the next slide but key key other item is in the last sub bullet uh, which is the fact that we're focusing on technical efficiency there's also operational efficiency that is important but it's beyond the scope of what we particularly are focused on. Operational efficiencies are things like, like sharing at, a, at the higher level, time sharing, dynamic spectrum access, and the like. So the progress that we've made in the first item, the clicker doesn't seem to be progressing the slide. Ah, uh, no. Oh, my Let me apologies. See I, okay, there you go. No, it's, it's okay. Um, the, the progress that's been made is, in fact, to produce the white paper that, that was passed along to, to all of you. This is a, a tremendous amount of work by, by several of the members of the team. 
Um, but we have identified an initial class, a set of classes, and, and do have the white paper in place that addresses those, bringing in a lot of the previous work that has been done in this area by the ITU and by SISMAC and by in, in uh, NTIA area, and by others in academia as well. And those references are in the text of, of that document. In producing the document and moving that forward, the excellent work that it is, we, we discovered something that perhaps others would be aware of, and that is that the spectrum efficiency is not a transmitter-oriented task. And we had largely treated it as such, as have previous studies in this area. It's really a systems-oriented um, activity if you're really trying to understand efficiency. That is to say the, the, the characteristics of the receiver are as important, if not more important, than the characteristics of the transmitter in being able to judge efficiency. And in fact, you should be judging the efficiency as received, not simply as transmitted. So that, that line of thinking, that aha, transformed our efforts and in fact, as you'll see in the next steps, propelled us to merge our idea to the receiver standard into idea one. And it now, we had done a, a substantial amount of work in the receiver area. Julie Knapp, in fact, it, it contributed significantly there along with Dale. And that now is an appendix to the, the overall spectrum efficiency. And we uh, attempted to begin the work of integrating the receiver and transmitter and the overall metrics in, in the white paper document that you have. So should we have a discussion of this is appropriate now, Dennis? That, that would probably be a very, very good idea. You can see the next steps before you of, of, of where we're going with this, but that, that's the, probably one of the big ahas of this, this uh, for this time around, and uh, we think it's propelling us into an interesting state. It's a very difficult state. I don't want to underestimate the, the difficulty of doing system level, because there's not much out there to be gleaned from academia or from industry or from regulatory environment. But it is where the important work really lies. Dick. I'd actually like to ask that there be a little amplification on what you mean by, by system level or, or even receiver side measurement. Um, I look at the end to end holistically and I look at the maybe the traditional view, which is uh, truly how many bits are you pushing through a, a finite amount of spectrum. Um, so maybe, maybe a little amplification would, would help us there? Sure. Yeah, the, the amplification, and I'm, maybe I'm trying to move too rapidly through this. Um, the, the amplification here, because we've, we've spent hours and hours getting here, and my covering it in two minutes is probably not, not at all adequate, so thank you. I, I'm really only going to eat five minutes. Yeah, well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the critical aspect of this is that you, you may have a, a wonderful transmitter that, that has great modulation schemes, great uh, use of the spectrum and picks the, the lakefront property and all of the rest. But if you have a receiver at the other end that's, that's wide open, that, that looks at its neighboring spectral regions, the efficiency that you really should be measuring is the, the efficiency of the whole spectrum that the receiver sees, independent of the, of the spectrum that it is allocated. So it may be allocated 10 megahertz of spectrum, but it's open to 30 megahertz, rendering the adjacent 20 megahertz unusable for similar purpose. So if you're actually measuring efficiency, the divisor becomes 30 megahertz, not 10 megahertz. So that was part of the, the aha in this. Because normally we would think of it as specified as 10 megahertz with transmission characteristics. The receiver receives in those 10 megahertz. But it actually doesn't allow the adjacent spectrum to be used for, for similar purpose. So it, it does dramatically reduce the system's level spectrum efficiency. So that's a, an example, one of actually several, but, but probably a pretty, pretty clear example of, of the thinking that moved us into this, this different line. Does that? Yeah. We, so, so essentially what you're saying in a, in a more, I guess, uh, traditional sense is you've got to burden the efficiency 
of that particular use with the guard band requirements that are established yes. by the end-to-end -end system. Exactly. That's exactly. Yeah, and whether they're whether they are established guard bands or whether, as we've seen with the recent light light square GPS situation, whether they are um, de facto guard bands that are, are there. That, that has to be built in and, and that's where the, the systems thinking comes in. Now, w within the world of cellular, you, you rigorously work those sorts of things, so it's not, not much of an issue there. But for the wide swath of, of systems that we're dealing with, we need to carefully think through this as a, as a component of the overall so use. now is what you're suggesting that you've laid that out yep. in here and that your plan is to socialize this among this group to seek this whole group to seek input right. as well as academia and others and so you would want the TAC the staff of the TAC to distribute this as broadly as possible amongst the community right S in order to collect input to inform a set of recommendations for the September meeting. Am I, that is correct. Am I close? That is correct. And, and we, this is one where it was a, a judgment call on our part because we would collectively point out that, that this is a rough draft. It is so labeled. So this is not a final piece of work that we would all like to have our name signed behind as, as something definitive. But we think that there is enough really solid thinking in this area that we would we would benefit as a working group from the input specifically from the TAC members but for those that that you're associated with be they in academia government or in, in corporate world that that really are focused in this area that would be very helpful to us this is just uh, totally off the wall but to uh, the FCC folks is this an NOI kind of issue you know, let's see, yeah, there was a, <laughs> there was the answer is absolutely not. <laughs> okay. okay, yes, it does, it does take, there, speaking of time, okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, we would, uh, it's probably a good point, but we would believe it not to be. This is, this is clearly a, a rough draft and an informal request. Non-APA informal NOI. <laughs> Got it. Whatever don't, that is. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. All right. Is there any is there any discussion on that approach and the soliciting from the committee comments on this document? I mean, this is a non-trivial document. <laughs> this is a non-trivial. I mean, document. You sh this is. I mean, I've seen it in various iterations through the through the process. There's some. I mean, there's some folks who have done some serious heavy lifting here. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, Greg, and then Dick. dealt with the receivers. Um, is, does this become a buyer beware problem? <coughs> and that uh, if the transmissions will not go beyond the channel that they're allotted, but if you're the buyer, you better make sure your receiver can only receive your channel. Um, well, there, there is some aspect to that, but that, that actually s speaks to the idea number two, which we're now, now Coming in, so may, maybe let me let me postpone that until I've had a little discussion on idea number two. But but okay. yes, that's an important thread. Dick, and then on the idea two. Well, actually, that that I think Greg raised the issue in a slightly different way than I'm going to, but it's similar. I think that the the ability to calculate here seems uniform and analytically accurate, but only if the definition of the required a bandwidth at the receiver is understood and agreed upon. So I think that the the point of um, argument is going to be one of uh, bandwidth uh, at the receiver. And for each type of, you've, you've made it clear that you've got to break out the various different types of communications and the spectrum they're on. Um, I think it's also important that 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 whole issue of receiver quality 
um, is going to really come into play here. What is the required amount of bandwidth? And that will vary by the piece of equipment. So how do you, how do you take the piece of equipment out of the calculation? Or said differently, if you leave it in, does that incent the manufacturers of the receivers to improve upon what they, they do today? So I, I really believe that number two is the bugaboo of, of idea number one here. No, that's quite correct. That, that's why I wanted to, to address right. it before so let's, I answered Let's go on the two. Yeah. So, let's see where we are with that. Okay. So this was the, the so named receiver standards. And again, I apologize for those who are offended by standards. But the, the, the key point is, as has now been discussed, that, that the receiver does greatly inhibit the efficiency of the spectral use in some cases. And the goal out of this, and will continue to be the goal even as we fold idea two into idea one, is that we find a way to establish guidelines and uh, ever raising guidelines, raising the bar, so that the, the receivers can be improved. There are lots of other trade-offs, economic trade-offs and usage trade-offs and all the rest, and we do talk about some of those in the paper, especially in the satellite case. You can dramatically enhance the, the uh, positive spectrum efficiency of a satellite receiver by having everyone who has a satellite receiver have a 20-foot dish that they carry around with them, but it's not entirely pragmatic. So there are other balance points, but, but we, we do need to focus on the receiver, and, and we believe it actually will benefit from an economic standpoint in that it will put energy into the design of ever improved receivers and the replacement, as we can identify the incentives, to replace existing receivers with new and improved receivers that will better and more efficiently utilize the spectrum and, and, and really ha establish a virtuous cycle in, in this receiver area. So the, the, the key progress in this area has been to identify, and, and this was, to me, was fascinating. I hope you will find it such when you read the appendix in the, in the white paper, but fascinating to, re to review a number of the critical areas where the characteristics of the receiver have, in fact, inhibited <laughs> what we would generally view as progress in spectrum efficiency or even in the availability of, of certain applications that required spectrum there are considerable lessons to be learned. We are still gleaning those lessons since we put most of our effort into identifying and documenting the, the challenge areas to date. And, and now, between now and the next time, we hope that we'll be able to glean key messages that we can, we can build into our, our recommendations going forward. So next time around in this area, actionable progress report is what we're, we're really looking for so that we can have more concrete recommendations around this area. And that because gets folded into this. Correct. Exactly so. Because it is all part of systems level. So we will go from five ideas to four ideas okay. going forward. Any, any comments on that strategy and recommendation? Okay. Number three. Okay, number three is a spectrum sharing taxonomy. This is, this is moving now into the operational side. How do we operationally share spectrum as opposed to the technical efficiencies that we were talking about in what were ideas one and two. In this area, one of the things that has been lacking is a, a listing of all of the, the sharing activities that that are in place today, and there are a lot of, of sharing activities that, that exist. So we would like to move this forward to help us as we, we try to operationally share in the future. There's been a great deal of progress here. John Chapin, to my right, uh, deserves an enormous amount of credit for pulling this together, and another fairly deep piece of technical work, which we've also distributed to the group, uh, in including a one of our great contributions as a working group to John's effort was to have him develop a one-page description of what the spreadsheet contained so that it was understandable to mere mortals. <laughs> uh, but 
this is a very, very good piece of work and again, a, an area where we, at this point, we've captured the taxonomy. We sent it out because we would solicit from the rest of the group other areas of sharing that should be added. The, the goal for us is that we would be able, with that input, to create a document that we would view to be at a version one level that can be um, fully released and released to a, a broader audience at that point. And then we would use that to establish norms and, and distill patterns that could be used to, to inform decisions made at the commission on future directions for sharing. So pause button, wait for comments. Comments on this. I mean, this is a really interesting direction that you and your group have headed uh, everything, Dennis, where you're actually producing fungible work product that can be used. Very scary, right? And, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not that we're turning around and asking people to do things. Your committee is actually stepping up and delivering on things. And that's a, it's a non-trivial activity on your part. And it's an interesting progression, I would note, for us because we started out with uh, have academic groups, have, and the further we got into it, we decided that we actually had a lot of the expertise that was either personally in the group or at our collective disposal, so we decided it was more efficient to actually produce. We still will be looking for the, the feedback from those very groups, but there's at least a base from which to work. Are we okay on three? Uh, yes, sir. David. Yes, that was by design. <laughs> I, I thought we weren't going to tell him. That installs a lot of Thank you. That saved me a lot of time. Uh, I've, I'm sorry that, that, that you haven't gotten um, those. We'll make sure. It's the only two I Yeah, well, I don't think we've got the rest. It's a lottery. I used, the, I, I used the same list that Chris had used to distribute the information for the meetings. So. We'll, yeah, it did come from. Well, we can we can we can resend, David. That's it. No, I, I just didn't know if I that we know how to do. Oh, and that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. I thought it might be everybody. It was personal. <laughs> just, you've had a uh, this potential out of irregularity. <laughs> you've had a problem with the dress list in the past. No, no, there, this I came from us. This, this, this came from the. No, it's a, it's a, the passing the dress list over through Outlook has been. I don't think this. Yeah, I propose we establish a list serve, a very, very <laughs> aggressive and new technology. What? <laughs> and, Fred, would you explain that to the group? How does that work, I John? The motion. <laughs> okay, number four. Well, David Wolf, I'm sorry. Chris is just walking in. He is the man who can fix that. <laughs> number four. Number four, moving from, from the spectrum side and on to the infrastructure side. This had. Our idea four was the overall uh, idea eight that we had sent forward to the chairman. This is a, a very exciting area with both near and long, mid and long term uh, opportunities. Uh, near term opportunities in areas where there is a spectrum available or where there, the use is uh, applying existing spectrum. But the whole notion here is to satisfy needs of high teledensity areas high data transfer areas and how to accomplish that in the most efficient way. I'm sure that Dick is going to point out very quickly that this is already being done and being done by outstanding corporate organizations that he knows a lot about. Um, but we, we felt that there were opportunities here, and I'm going to move to the next slide, to, to move this forward. Uh, particularly around some of the areas that are difficult for our, our close friends in the carrier world, and that is in the area of offering ubiquitous uh, devices, ubiquitous femto cells or ubiquitous DAS systems or, or the like. And part of our basis is that there has been great success on a very ubiquitous technology called Wi-Fi with the offloading of, of cellular traffic into Wi-Fi, which, which doesn't care which carrier particularly that it's connected to um, and using similar kinds of approaches that that might, that might uh, be an effective move forward. We also would observe that a lot of this seems to be happening 
and we're we're scrambling to keep up and maybe a little bit ahead of, of what's going on in some of these spaces. The progress of the month, we have had outreach to a number of groups, owners of, of buildings, discussions with carriers, and I would note that that uh, Brian Daly uh, representing the carriers is part of our working group, um, also users, but, but we've been socializing this in a lot of communities, socializing it within academia as well to see how this, this plays when passed by these various constituencies. And it seems to play extremely well, is the observation. But there's a lot of, of fleshing out that, that needs to be done. The, the key goal for us is to establish a forum and test this in a, in a larger body here in this very room in September, and we're working on a date to do that, with the goal of, of bringing the, the right people together to, to talk about this, use that to to better and in a more rigorous way inform us on this issue and the, the challenges that are associated with it, both devices, citing issues, and those citing issues which, which relate to some of the things that Dick will be talking about shortly, uh, also include the, the government facilities and the opportunities to, to try this in those facilities, as well as just moving forward on and, and cheering on the people that are running with these directions quite in spite of the work that we might be doing within this body. So, I'm sorry, Walt. Well, just one quick question. Uh, I think uh, you talked about uh, quality of service. Do so, uh, you look at reliability aspects of this too? As you go to smaller and smaller uh, cells, the tendency is to uh, look at them as uh, anecdotal network pieces and not infrastructure pieces. And, to the, and that's great if they are, in fact, anecdotal, but to the extent it becomes pervasive, um, are we looking at the issues that come up in public safety in terms of reliability, uh, powering issues, um, and, and whatever that might mean? Yeah. yeah. The answer is yes. In fact, on the, the previous slide uh, in the, the problem statement, quality of service is called out, and, and the fit for fit for service for, for purpose is, is an important part of this. That you what, what's your quality service? Okay, yeah, it's trying to fit it on a slide. In fact, it used to say quality of service, and now it's QOS. Um, but but it, the notion, that there is sensitivity, at least within the working group, that this has to be no different in terms of the, the quality, the capabilities that exist uh, in, in other means of getting their standard base stations or what have you. Right. So let's look at your three next steps and make sure that we understand them correctly. Bullet one, follow up with GSA, is an assignment to the FCC, which is really a tag on to our previous recommendation from Dick's group. Right. With support from the, our working group. So we're right. willing to support, but, right. but yeah. certainly that, yes. Um, uh, but it's a, but it, this is a request to the FCC. I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm And I'm Julie has, since. We did follow up with Julie. Well, we Julie and John, yeah, John's here, so speak. Yeah, we, had a, we had a, uh, a staff meeting, staff to staff meeting with GSA and, um, they're, they have actually it's a pretty good time. They have a group of people that's thinking that are thinking about some similar issues. So, so there's some follow. -through there's some follow through on it. Yeah, we need to yeah. follow up yep. further with them. But so yeah. bullet two is, first is a working group exercise to define issues and a couple of recommendations. And and the forum we would hope would help us with this as well. And it does fit in with the GSA because just yeah. that's part they, of the site. Yeah. Right. Right. So and bullet three is again something that the FCC needs to. Do. I'm just trying to parse that. Who owns it? Who's the next to rank? So the FCC owns one and three, and the working group owns two. Yeah, well, the working group also is supporting all three. So oh, totally it, understand. Yes, yes, but in terms of convening the forum here at the FCC, the FCC clearly owns the convening. Got it. Okay. Yep. Any thoughts on this from the group? Going once, going twice. Just, just yes, Dick. One, one point to Walter's uh, comment before. Um, in, in this this new great world that Dennis is describing here, the end uh, sites, these these very small sites, may in some cases be carrier provided. They may build building owner provided, and and those two things suggest slightly different levels of reliability sensitivity in themselves. But the third piece is that you're going to see consumers 
owning the end links in many cases and they will by virtue of the commercial relationships that develop will end up sharing those with other end users i don't think you're going to have an awful lot of reliability sensitivity on that end point and i'm not sure that there's a quick and easy way to solve for that one but as you think this reliability thing through think of those different multiple types of sensitivities by the owners of the endpoints. Yeah, and I think really? that's a very good point, and, and the, the, the latter is, of course, a problem today, since femto cells do exist, carrier-focused femto cells, as an example. John, you had a comment then, David? I think there's a parallel to the first group on this point, which is that I think we need to look at this as a system, in a system-wide yes. level, which mm -hmm. is to say, my femto cell, I might go and buy a femto cell at Best Buy or something, and it, it you know, not as carrier-grade, it fails, uh, but can my device then fall back onto a macro cell or some other network? Um, and does that? You know, you can tell a lot about people by their ringtone. Exactly. <laughs> spirits. It's actually were my me. Verizon phone. So <laughs> <laughs> the spirits were telling me that that was enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> David, I don't want to actually do engineering here, but an engineering thought occurred to me, which I think is significant. If you look at Wi-Fi, one of the carrier point of view, I don't know whether you think Wi-Fi is your friend or your enemy, but one of the advantages of having consumer deployment occur on the Wi-Fi level is it's usually impossible by misconfiguring a Wi-Fi base station to mess up your cellular system. <laughs> and by working in actually different parts of the spectrum, you, you actually can isolate the behavior of different right. business entities, but also technical entities. And so hmm. thinking through the interplay between how you use spectrum, how you, what the business relationships are, you, you can actually clean up some problems that let different actors go forward independently. Yes, right, right. right. No. right. And, and that's, that's one of the challenges. We, we are the TAC, not the, the business advisory council, but there are business models that are interesting, especially as you would think of buildings where yep. carriers that's would, would establish, no, no, it's not a toughie. It would establish a relationship with the, with the business owner, the building owner, and and contract for service so that there, there are some there's some very interesting models that, that come out okay of let's that. move let's yes. move to recommendation five recommendation five which is recommendation which, number last yes which is uh, an interesting one which is to move more service onto the carriers in effect and and this would be in an offload fashion potentially but um, also enable uh, a, a variety of different applications and we've highlighted them here from utilities to, to enterprise to even public safety as potential candidates for offloading portions of their needs and portions of their specific applications to, to carriers. And the, there are some of these things that ob obviously are happening right now, but how to, to do this in a, in a broader fashion is the goal of this idea. Um, the progress in the area has been to first understand what the, the challenges are, the processes in order to qualify systems level applications within carriers today. Um, there's a perception that that's very difficult, but getting to the reality is, is something that we're, we're working our way through. We do know that, that there are, are challenges in that today qualification has to occur carrier by carrier. And that by itself is, is a friction point, an inhibitor to moving forward. Whether that can be ameliorated or not is another question, but it, it is one of the things that we're pulling together. The other uh, area here is to identify in a, beyond the industries that I've rattled off, and government for that matter, to get down to an application level. What are the applications that might reasonably be offloaded and what would be the, the value associated with that? In line with the last idea, and in fact we, we thought we would uh, get a twofer, if you will, the, the goal is to convene a workshop that would be on the same day as the workshop we just discussed in a day in September, so we would do a morning and an afternoon kind of session, where the a afternoon presumably would be focused on the friction point area, and we have established a, a list of potential invitees and uh, people to speak to the, the group so that we can really get to the meat of the matter and see if we can't extract from the people who are involved the, the, the relevant needs 
so that we can make a, a strong and very specific recommendation to the TAC at our next meeting at the end of September. Great. Any comment? Yeah. Marvin. Is, is there a connection here with the effort to uh, uh, turn off the PSTN and make broadband ubiquitously available uh, at household endpoints that some of these uh, services that we deliver for gas or, or electricity and that require a backhaul network uh, that is ubiquitous could be moved in conjunction with that ubiquitous broadband that we're talking about in our earlier discussion? Yeah, no, that's a very reasonable part of this, and that, that is part of the landscape that we're talking about. So these things are not totally independent. Further comments on topic five? Thank you, Dennis, not only for the hard work and to, to Julie and to John Leibowitz for uh, their assistance as well as to your whole uh, working group. Uh, you not only uh, tackled a major issue, but you tackled it in record speed, so thank you. <laughs> uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen, making his farewell appearance. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's, 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 the FCC here because they've helped to edit down our presentation this time because there's actually some some ongoing activities here so uh, we were able to take out uh, at least one of our, uh, our recommendations is no longer necessary um, you may recall last time that um, here we go. you may recall last time that we provided a number of uh, recommendations that we're frankly Tom very happy to see the FCC is already taking action on it I suspect you two had something to do with that, so thank you. Um, but we've, we've got a couple more that follow in the same line uh, that we did last time here. And um, uh, let's start with the state and local permitting process. Last time we talked about it from a perspective of towers. And you could read this uh, particular one that is labeled state and local permitting process to be all about uh, towers for wireless, but really it is not. As we got into more dialogue, we realized that there was, there was just as much, um, I'm going to use the word obstruction relative to inconsistency in the uh, permitting processes at the state and local level over conduit and, and other rights of way uh, as there, there is over towers. And so this particular recommendation that we have this time while it is again a bully pulpit type of uh, recommendation uh, for the FCC does focus on the the more holistic need for uh, capabilities to to put uh, facilities yes. that and, um, can encourage broadband deployment uh, onto uh, state and local municipal government properties um, the idea is quite simple and it's repetitive from what we had last time so I will really not read it all to you but um, I think the FCC can again sponsor some education and communications in the areas to the state and local governments to explain to them that this is not an onerous problem for them but rather it is a, an economic opportunity for them something that uh, is I think missed often so the next steps uh, encourage collaboration uh, to identify tools, um, something that uh, if you're going to invent the wheel at every local municipal level, it's obviously too expensive and too onerous for them to do. So to the extent that we can have collaboration encouraged, I think that's important. Um, the, the workshops is merely the communications path, the, the way to do this. And I think most importantly, if we can find a way to identify and publish best practices through the Commission out to the local level, I think that that helps to solve their, their problem of not knowing where to get started. They've got something that they can adapt. So that, that is the essence of, of our first recommendation here. Okay, is there any discussion? Let's, let's see if we can. Okay. Anybody have thoughts? Okay. okay. Very good. Uh, move on to the, the second one, and that is uh, building ingress problems. Now, we talked last time about uh, government buildings and of course uh, we heard today that uh, action is taking place there and that the GSA is actively involved in that area which is good. Um, now we're talking about privately owned buildings. 
Um, you, when you think about it, um, there's a heck of a lot more privately owned buildings, and as you think about the uh, topology of um, or distribution of uh, facilities for broadband, we clearly have to rely on on the private sector buildings as a means of of providing for the sites that we need or for the the conduit pass through that that we might need. Again, the FCC can be instrumental here, and for the same reason that they can be focused on helping the state and local municipalities understand the value of broadband. Um, a, a private owner needs to understand that by inhibiting carriers and others from getting into their facilities, they're really uh, lowering the value, the inherent value of their facility to, to any other tenants. And so I think it's important here that they begin to understand that there can be best practices for entry into the building so that they can gain value and benefit from others' willingness to invest inside their private facility. Um, this one, I think, is harder to address in one respect, but it's easier in another, and that is that there are so many of these buildings that we can't really legitimately and with a straight face sit here to the FCC and say we'd like you to go out and talk to these people or communicate with them, but rather work with us or work with yourselves um, to develop a brochure that the carriers and that others who want access to these buildings can present to the, the private building owner. There's a lot more credibility when it's got that seal on it than it does when it's got the Verizon emblem on the back of it or someone else just picking on myself. But I think that there's a real opportunity to have credibility to, to send this message across to the private owners, even though delivered by the carrier. You know, Dennis may have set us on um, uh, the right track for this as well with the work that has come out of the, his working group mm -hmm. and that, in fact, this is something that this body can do to identify what are those best practices rather than just say to the commission you should do it we've got the wherewithal here to do it ourselves and then to present that for the logo if you will that's exactly what i'm suggesting that, that okay. clearly we need that uh, emblem on the back to indicate that it is something that is not just a private industry right. effort but rather something that really does have value for all right. so I like this point a lot. I think you present it well, and I like the idea that you, you know, that you rec recommend. In the idea, you mentioned private land as well as private building owners, and I wondered if we could expand the next step to, to also target private land because there's it, the problem exists, you know, equally there that you know sometimes we would we could have like trouble getting um, to like say an apartment building because we have to cross um, somebody else's yeah. land. That that kind of thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. that that. Um, overlap slightly with one we presented last time relative to rights of way, but I think you make a great point, and it can be that same brochure that explains right. it. Yes, clearly. So, okay. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> Just very briefly, this turns out to be an area where, completely unrelated to MIT, I've actually had some experience, and there are in fact conferences of building managers. And they have workshops on how to extract maximum value from broadband ingress. <laughs> and a few years ago, their strategy was to pick one provider and enter into a monopoly relationship in which they wouldn't let anybody else into the building. And then they could charge their tenants a surplus, and there was a kickback. And these plans were being discussed in building managers' conferences. So there is a way to get some traction beyond just writing a brochure, which is to understand where these people get together and talk and to try to help them understand what best practice really is because some of them really got screwed after they entered into those monopoly relationships and then the company in question went bankrupt. But they couldn't get out of the agreement. <laughs> and so there is an issue of best practice and how to articulate it, but they have active interest in it. Of course, their interest is to extract maximum value and that could be to make their build building more valuable or it could be if they think the building is value much then to extract rents of a monopoly sort. So it's a, it's, a, it's a space where you can you can get traction and they are interested. I think that's very good to add on to this. Um, I, I have been to one of those meetings. In fact, you mentioned this to me two years ago. Uh, but um, <laughs> the, the point that, uh, that I'd like to add to this is we've got to get more building owners to go to those meetings, which is another issue. But yep. let's take uh, what David just suggested coupled with what 
Better you business just suggested bureaus. it and All uh, kinds of we'll enhance the next steps. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, just to one more I'm thing. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Greg. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, what you mentioned might be illegal. Um, the, uh, some of the regulations I found pro prohibit a building from uh, forcing one service on its, on its uh, uh, participants or members. But the, the main thing I wanted to ask was uh, you were talking about uh, having a, a way to get this message to the building owners, not through a company. Uh, Walter, do you know if LSGAC still exists? You know what that is? That's the local and state government something committee. It was a, an FCC uh, committee. And uh, I know they were around in 2009. Um, I don't know if they're still around. I thought there was a there was a process going on currently. We we did a PN not too long ago. I thought, but I'm not I can't I'm not pause it on that. We can get back on that. But that might be a perfect group for you to to deal with if they're still around. It sounds so, like it isn't, but maybe. But I, I think it's not currently that we we extended the time deadline for them. I think that we have the authority for them, but the the group has not been named, and I think that's a process that's underway. Okay. John suggests that there was folks who reached out. To them. Yeah, there, there's there's like an umbrella organization of real estate groups interested in connectivity issues that reach out to us in the context of the small cell stuff. I think there's obviously a synergy here with that. So we'll That's we'll just unite the streams. Okay. Well, I think the key here to finish this one up, Tom, is just that um, all of these to me sound like substantive additions to the next steps opportunity list. Okay. So we'll do that. Any further comments on? On to the last item, the last thing you will ever present to the TAC, <laughs> Dick. Here it is. Well, we bring back, we, we like bring back retired members. I, I, would, I would like to note that Dick, in the last comment, said that we will, we will follow up on that as we move forward. And <laughs> I, that sounded very much like a retraction of his earlier. <laughs> very good. Thank we, you. We speak for looking out for the welfare of the organization. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, we, we do have one item that I, I don't want to leave behind, and that is that uh, we still do not have agreement within the group, but we still have a lot of dialogue going on relative to this middle mile provider concept um, and the cost um, that that middle mile may, in fact, attribute to the totality of the broadband cost in the country. So uh, I think there's more work to be done on that one. Uh, so while we're showing it here as one that's still outstanding, uh, we're not providing recommendations because in, my, in our view, uh, as a group, we have yet to come to an agreement on how to do that. Okay. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for listening and thanks to the group. Dick, thank you very much for all your contributions. You want this back? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, don't throw it. Okay. We have been through, this has been a, uh, a, a tour de force, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so thank you to everybody for, for your participation and contributions. Are there any other things that anybody wishes to bring before the body before we bring the gavel down? For instance, IPv6 and other things. Good point. Very valid. Yeah. Uh, to the uh, committee chairman uh, and the committee members, and to uh, the team uh, from the commission, uh, John and Walt and Doug and Mike and Dina and Lisa, who has left, thank you all very much. We stand adjourned. Thank you for keeping us on time. Hey.